All right, we are live. Hey everybody and welcome back. Um, today we're going to be picking up the next to last step on this painting. We're just going to be blocking in lights today. Um, up until now we did our what we call our flats, which was the initial lay-in of grayscales after doing our transfer. Last week we did our, our shadows, and so we rolled from shadow, made our gradients and transitioned into our base value, the one that was um, supposed to be in our flats. And if you remember, I said in our flats, I actually had to wipe out a little bit, and so we're seeing a little bit more of the board showing through. And this is what I was talking about. You can see the difference between the flat, what should have been the value of the panel, and what actually went down. Because I wiped out, we see a difference here. If the flat, if the flat shade I put down in the first stage matched this, if it was solid enough, this would transition and we'd have nothing but this shade rolling across the rest of the face. It's not a big deal, as I said last time. Uh, it's an easy thing to manage, but if you don't have to manage it because you've taken greater care in that first stage, it's gonna, it, it, it just makes life easier for you, okay? So from here, we're just gonna start blocking in, uh, blocking in our lights. We wanna pay attention to our value range. If you look down at my palette here, I've basically put together five values, and this accounts for um, the first value is the one that bumps up against the shadows, what should be the value of my flat, right? And then this is gonna be the brightest highlight, which is probably on the tip of the nose. Um, there may be a couple of other places where you'll find that, but more likely this is gonna be the highlight, the brighter light in all the other places, but that highlight may be in the eyes and, and on the tip of the nose. And then these two are just gonna bridge the gap they're going to, this is going to hold the place of, of a lot of what is in the light, right? Because these are going to read as highlights. And I can, I'm actually going to show that to you. I'll try to make a little bit of sense of it. Um, can we do this here or is it better up on here? Up there. So, and again, we talked about this last time. Just try to make a little bit of sense. So this first value, which is, again, it's, it's what I started out, I toned the board with, and it's the lightest value in my shadows, right? It's the one that transitions out of shadows into lights. So I've made a swatch, and I can kind of move this around the photograph, and I can see where it matches. Like, so here, it's way too dark. As I bring it in, I can see right about here is where it matches the value of the face. So it's like right in here. If I come down in here, it really matches somewhere back in here, not at the very edge of the shadow, but kind of out in here. And again, I hope everybody can make that out, right? If I put it here, you get a sense of where it starts to match and then it becomes too dark. I can see that it's on the very edge of the nose out here. I get a sense of it down in here that it comes not to here, but all the way up to here. And so I know this entire side of the face can be used, we can use this, right? Even in here, I know this is actually darker, but I get a sense that this in here matches this shade pretty well, right? And so all I want to do is I want to get a sense of where this shade goes. Now, I can do this with, with each one of these swatches, and this is what I recommend to you while you're trying to learn how to do this. Don't guess. Don't wing it. Have a formula that guarantees success. I now know, based on that swatch, everywhere in this face where that shade goes. I tested it. And if I have a bad memory, I'll check it again later on as I'm working, just to make sure. Now, I'm going to grab, um, well, I'm going to go through the scale. I'll go to the next value. So this is one lighter. And again, I know that the first, the first my, we're going to refer to that as my flat. That's the first shade. It's the darkest light and the lightest shadow. So my flat ends about here. This shade is going to fall in right beside it. And again, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm giving a view for the camera. But as I slide this across, it's too light, too light, too light, and boom, there it goes. That's a match. It's not a color match. It's a little bit, this photograph's a little bit blue, or this feels a little green next to it. But from a value standpoint, it is the same value. So now I know, like above this tear duct is where this shade starts. And I get a sense of how far it goes. Like here, it's too dark now. This is lighter. But it gives me a sense of where this goes. Same in here. If I look around in here, this is actually the lightest value that I can put in here before starting to get outside of the value range that matches the photograph, right? You can see it. There's nothing in here that's lighter. Now, in the eye there is, but even here, this value works for that light on top of the eye. It's a pretty good match. So again, I can just move around in here. This is lighter than what's in here, kind of lines up with what's in the filter from here. 
down in here is just, it's actually a good middle ground between the flat and that highlight. It's just a little bit darker than the highlight, and it kind of works out here. It's a little bit light, I gotta be like, right there is about in the cheek, so we get, like all of this is gonna be the flat, and then this is where I'm gonna hit this value. Same up in here. I'm a little bit light, which means I'm probably, this is probably too light for the flat value, but too dark for this, which means it's gonna to have to be a mixture of the two as I go. Even in here, I can see in that eye, there's a highlight at the very top of that, and the flat is gonna cover most of it. This just sits right in between, right on the edge, and that's about where it disappears. Now, that highlight in there is just subtly lighter than this, so it'll be just a very, a very subtle shift. I'm gonna move up my scale to my next value. This is my middle value, and again, like this is going to account for most of the value of the forehead, right? It's almost a perfect match in there. Same out here. It's gonna be good for out here, but not the highlight. It's actually light in the nose, and, and so to give you an idea of how dark the nose is, this is the, my second value. It's about the right value for all of this dark in here. So the, the flat value will be at the very edge, and then this will take up pretty much everything else. My next value up is actually going to do a pretty good job of approximating some of the lights that are on the bridge of the nose. Not the, not the really bright highlights, but the stuff up in here. This does a pretty good job of approximating that. Again, it's good in here, not for the brightest stuff, but for the darker things down in here. It's good in the cheek here. It's good in the eye, in, around the eye over here. Right, so I'm starting to get a sense, and I would say it's actually too light for these highlights. So again, I'm, I'm only looking at my third value, <clears throat> but this is already too bright to be a highlight in the chin. I could probably get away with it if I filled this shade the whole way and then laid this on top and it mixed in a little bit. That's probably what I'll do. But you can see it's a little bit lighter than what's here. So I wanna make sure that I'm controlling my values and this is how I can do it. I can, I can do an area, like so, what I would recommend to you while you're doing this is you're experimenting with this at home, first of all, do a grayscale painting, not a color painting. If you can do it in grayscale, then you can build it out and do it in color. If you do it in color, you may fail miserably because the colors are a problem. You do it in grayscale, it's a small step, but it is a step in the direction of getting understanding. Once you understand that in grayscale, creating a scale of color is not that difficult. And we're gonna go through that next week. How we translate the gray painting into the color painting, we're gonna go into that because there's gonna be almost no work left on this for next week. So my plan is to show you how we connect the grayscale painting using swatches to the color painting using swatches. So, but anyway, you can do one section at a time. I have my five values, and I can actually figure out exactly where each one of these values goes in the forehead and only paint them there, and then knock the edges down. Then I can move down and do the same in here, I can do the eye, I can do one little piece at a time. And slowly work through my scale, checking each value as I go to make sure that I'm getting the values where they go. Now, I would say that most people would be sitting there going, whoa, that's cheating. It's not cheating. So what you're doing is you're teaching your brain how to see, right? So I look at these values and with the swatches, I can make sense of them here, right? So I can mix these values and then look at my photograph and be like, okay, I think this one goes here, this one goes here, this one goes here. Then when I take the swatches and I see what they actually do, my brain will calibrate its thinking, its processing, and say, oh, when you see this, it, it's actually gonna look like this in your painting or against the photograph. And what, what happens is your brain starts to align these things, right? All of this learning, all of it, whether we're doing basic grayscale or we're doing proportional drawing or, or what we're doing here with these, color swatch, uh, these grayscale swatches or if we're doing it in color, all of them, what they do, as long as we try to do it with our eyes first and then use something like the swatches to test to see if we were right or wrong, by getting the right or wrong from the swatch after using our eyes to try to figure it out, our brain is able to make sense of what it believes it perceives and then compare it to what it actually perceives. And every time you do that, the two get a little bit closer together. Your brain is able to make greater and greater sense to the point where you can look at this and recognize the values without any kind of tools. We do that in proportional drawing. Anyone who's in Evolve who's gone through proportional drawing knows the goal is not to be stuck with a tool that you measure with forever, 
but to develop a skill so that you don't need the tools, that you can just look with your eyes and see. And so that's what we'd, we would do here. But while you're first learning, use the swatches. They're a good, you don't want them to become a crutch where you use them first to see what color, what goes where, but you look at the value and try to figure out where it goes and then test, the, put the swatch up to see if you're right. You're basically using the swatches to proof what you already looked at with your eyes and believe. And so this is going to be a way, again, to train your eyes and your brain to process this visual stimulation and make greater sense of it. If you just use the swatches to figure out where things go and you never look at the photograph to try to assess where these values fit in here, the swatches are going to become a crutch. You will depend on them forever. We don't want crutches, we want tools. And that's a very, very important thing. Now, that being said, you want to lean on a crutch for the rest of your life? That's up to you. Um, you can do that, and it's absolutely fine, but it's, you're always going to be held back. And the amount of work to do it and to develop the skill where eventually you don't need the tool anymore is, is really not much more effort than if you just, uh, if you just you know, use them as a crutch. So if the, if the amount of energy to get the skill where you don't need the, the tools is equal to the one where you do need them, why wouldn't you go in the direction of not needing them? Right? And it just takes a little bit of confidence on your part to step into it and say, hey, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to struggle a little bit, but that's okay because that's how I'm going to learn. The struggle is fine as long as you don't give up. The struggle is fine. Eventually, your brain will put it all together and you'll find out one day, like, I don't need the swatches. I don't need to measure. I don't, right? I can just see these things with my eyes. So anyway, going, continuing along on the swatches. So now I'm to my, my next to last light. And again, I put this up here and I get a sense of how bright it is. It handles this highlight beautifully on the forehead. It handles the brightest part of the highlight in the nose. It's a little bit, I'd say it's a little bit shy of the highlight in the cheek here. It's pretty good for down in here as well. Definitely too light down in here. Doesn't belong out here at all. So I'd say from here over, this, this value doesn't belong at all. So I just want to be thoughtful about that. And then, of course, my last value, which is this really bright one, probably functions well for the highlight on the tip of the nose. Um, maybe a touch down in here where this is really bright. Probably a little bit in here. And then the, the highlights inside of the eyes. That's it. But that gives me a range. And then like once I have this figuring out what's going down in here, I can see this value doesn't belong anywhere down in here. Maybe for the strap but it doesn't really belong down in here anywhere. My range, I'd say my lightest value really is probably my middle shade, right? This functions as my highlights down here pretty well, right? So this drop off, as I get further away from the light source, which is up here, this gets darker and darker. So the chin, the highlight on the chin, though it was just as bright as some of this other stuff, is actually not. It's brighter up here and darker as it goes down, even darker down here. So these highlights on the collarbone, they're really, they're really the middle of our value scale. And knowing that will allow me to control the impression of light and shadow moving across the subject. And of course, we did this with the shadows. I showed that to you last week. And now we're going to manage it with the lights. So I'm now going to, um, I'm just going to start laying in some paint. And again, I already know where some of these things go. I put a little bit of medium in the paint. I think um, I have about four centimeters of paint, and I put about three or four drops of oil. So the paint's not wet and slippery. Um, we'll see how it, it should be a pretty decent density um, for me to work. I like to work a little bit heavier in my lights. And, and so, um, so this, this is good for me. If I find it's a little too thick, well, the old Holland paint is really dense. Um, if I find it's too thick, I'll just thin it down a little bit. And so here, I'm going to start by, I'm going to, uh, again, I'm going to start with my forehead. Um, Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a little bit different than I did last time. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to exhaust this value. I'm going to paint everything with this value. I'm then going to move to the next value and paint everything with that value that gets it, and I'll marry its edges to this one, and I'll work my way through the scale that way. Rather than doing one section at a time, um, I spent a lot of time on the forehead last time. I, I, like half the, uh, half the time I was painting, I think I was on the forehead, and then I knocked out the rest of it in, in the remaining hour and a half. I don't want to do that. I want to kind of get this shade down and then move through the scale. This is such a small thing to cover. It's very easy to manage that. And this is, again, it's a little bit more of an assembly line approach 
but assembly lines are good once you once you know what you're doing they definitely speed up the process every time i've got to wipe a brush or switch a brush as i move through these values uh, it's it, it eats up a moment and those moments over the course of you know 500 a thousand decisions they start to pile up so All right, and this is reading as lighter than this. Right, it's the same paint. I got a little bit of medium in it. Right, this is a little bit closer to this, and it's just this is dry. Um, I will soften this edge. You'll see me dissolve it. Um, not too worried about the, the the difference here. It's easy enough for me to kind of work into it. Again, some places there's a little bit more paint, some places a little bit less. But I do know that this value in here and this one, they come out of the same tube. They should actually play very nicely when they're both dry. I'm a little surprised at the difference in value right now. Um, I'm not sure why it's so, so broad, um, to, be, to be frank. Um, but I'm going to cover up. Like, so I'm, I'm leaving. Basically, I'm filling the area that I found that first swatch should fill in here. And then I'm going to dissolve the edge against this. And it may be that this is darker because I blended and contaminated this shade with all these darks. And I might find that, I might find that to be the case everywhere in here. If so, it's going to be very easy to just dissolve this edge. I don't even need to do anything darker. And I'm going to dissolve it. You'll see me do that um, while I'm working. But I'm going to cover everything with this that I believe should have this shade, dissolve this edge, and then I'll be able to work across from there. In here, just against the eyebrow. All right, and I said above the tear duct is where the next shade comes in. This is going to come along here, something like that. I have this, another brush that I'm just going to use to blend. Um, and all I'm going to do is scrub the edge a little bit, not aggressively, just kind of knock it down until I see it fade. Paying attention to the shapes. I don't want to create new shapes or unexpected shapes as I do this. So I'm paying attention to it as I go. Again, my blending brush, I am going to um, I am going to wipe it a lot while I'm working so that I'm not moving heavy amounts of paint into these areas. I don't want it. And again, it doesn't have to be silk smooth. It just has to be graded. It just has to be soft edged. Okay? So, so that should suffice. It's the same down here. And again, I'm leaving some texture with brush strokes behind. It's okay. Texture is fine as long as it's intended. Right? You don't want to have texture that you don't intend in your painting. Everything you do in your painting should, should be... So let me actually address that while I'm actually here, something we haven't talked about. So, so to me, making art is about intent. I, and pretty much everything in life is. But in art, may, what you, in order to make art, you have to have intent. That's my belief. And, and this is one of the problems with abstract art is that the vast majority of people who create abstract art have no intent. They throw paint at a canvas and they hope that something happens. Um, that's not all abstract artists, but way too many. The number, the percentages are well into the 90% range. Um, people who are completely ignorant of how anything works, but they like throwing paint at a canvas and they like to call themselves an artist. Um, there's no intent. Right? They're just looking to see what, what, what momentum and gravity do when they toss paint at a canvas or whatever medium they're working with. To me, that's not art creation. You can create some things that are quite beautiful that way, but that's not art creation. Art creation it has to have intent. Right? You have to know what you're trying to do. And so an abstract artist who has an idea in their head, an abstract design in their head, and knows what they're doing can actually paint exactly what they see in their mind's eye. That, that is painting with intent, and that, I think, with abstract art that's done that way should be celebrated because that is, that is a, it's an impressive thing if you can do that. Um, but there are very few people who can. Um, I can never remember the guy's name, but there's a, there's a guy that I'm friendly with on, uh, online 
that is incredible at this stuff. His use of uh, vibrating colors and his edge work and his, just his value, and, I mean, just his control of all of the moving parts of, of, of art making are incredible. Um, I don't want to give the impression that I'm, that I'm, um, I'm a hater of uh, abstract art because that's, that's not the case. I'm, I'm, I'm more impressed with good abstract painters than I, than I am with realist painters uh, because I know how this is done. The abstract stuff, I struggle with because I have played with it. I struggle with it. Um, you have to have, have an incredible vision to be able to do it, to do it well. And so, um, but intent is what, is what we're talking about here. And so for me, like the marks that I put down, I can make this edge what I want it to be as long as I know why I'm doing it. Right? I can leave brush marks, I can leave loose strokes, I can do heavy paint, but I, should, I need to know why I'm doing it. It shouldn't be a random thing that fell off the brush and, oh, that looks nice, I'm just going to leave it. That's not painting with intent. That's, you don't ever want to have, Bob Ross was famous, happy accidents was one of his things. You should never be happy if you get an accident that looks better than what you intend. Um, that shows a big gap in your skills. Right? When you do this, you want to be in command of this, right? Never be a victim of what happens. Always be in control of the, of the work while you're going. And what that requires is planning in advance of the painting, so making your values what they need to be, having a command over your tools, having a command over the understanding, setting up a plan for moving the paint from your palette up to your canvas, and then being really careful, methodical as you work, not rushing, but taking your time and being very particular about every mark that you make so that it is the mark you intend. Good enough is never good enough if you want to do this at, a, at an exceptional level. And I, that's a very important thing. There are no cut corners. There's no rushing. There's, there's just the best you can deliver. And we're not talking about perfection, right? Every, anybody who listens to me knows we don't strive for perfection. It's an elusive thing. You'll never get there. Because when you get to a place where you perceived was perfection a, le uh, a week ago, the bar will have moved on you because you got to a place based on understanding, but your understanding has increased over the time while you learn to get to that point. So now the bar is moved a week down the road and it continues to move. What we strive for is excellence, which anybody at any level can deliver any day. Excellence is simply the best you have to deliver. It's your 100%. We make that choice every brushstroke we make. And so it's something which is within the ability of every person. And it, the standard is, a, is different for every person depending on where they are in their, in their training and with everything else they have going on in their life. What that also does is it allows you on one day to really be on your game and deliver excellence and then another day have a lot of things going on in your life that are weighing on you and not produce at the same level but still be delivering excellence because it's simply the best you have on that day. And that, to me, that takes a lot of pressure off. You can't lean on it as an excuse to do bad work, but it takes the pressure off. All you have to do is deliver the best you can. And at the end of the day, it's not a matter of being proud of the artwork you've done, or whatever it is you've done, but it's about being proud of the fact that you delivered 100%. Because I can tell you, in life, most people deliver 20% in everything they do. You watch it around. Once you, once you produce it 100%, you start to realize just how little effort goes into most things for most people. Um, so. Find that way to get 100% and be happy with that because that, that in and itself is an achievement. Okay, so um, moving down. So in here, I just want to test this because I know in here I already covered it with this shade last week. So I know I need to go one step lighter to hit the highlights, but I do want to make sure that, that this value is, yeah, so this value is reading lighter. So I'm actually going to use this and I'm going to fill. I'm not really sure why, this is, why there's so much of a difference. And again, I know these materials. I'm not really sure why I'm getting such a value difference, but that's okay. I just work with it. That's all. I just work with it. I'm not being thrown by it. I just work with it. Once I have this down, then I'll just move my scale exactly as I planned. And again, so this value is going to take me a little bit longer to manage, 
because it's not just gonna cover what's already down. I've really gotta think about it. Once I get this one down though, everything that follows should flow pretty readily because it's just an expansion of moving off of this value. So this becomes the, the, the anchor, and then we're gonna build out from there in the direction of our brightest light. And in each section, we'll know what the brightest light is gonna be. So all we're doing is moving from our darkish, the first shade that went down, we can put down the brightest shade in the area and then just bridge the gap with whatever fits in between. So it becomes a pretty straightforward thing. And again, I've just, for the eye, I've come down to a smaller brush. It'll just be a little bit more delicate in here. And you can see as I'm doing this, I'm being gentle. A little bit of pressure, the bristles of the brush don't even bend. I'm putting such a small amount of pressure on the brush. That way I'm not delivering a, a large paint load. Um, it's giving me a more subtle, a, a more subtle um, pass, allowing some of what's underneath to show through. And while I'm here, I'm just going to drop in. I know they're going to get lighter, but just drop those in for now. There are darker areas in here. I'm going to leave them. I'm going to kind of go around them. And as I'm working, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to pose them. I know Daniel is answering a lot of things kind of as I'm working. Um, but if you have questions, please pose them. If some of them he'll present to me um, so I have something to talk about while I'm doing this. For those of you all who have not been to the other live streams on this video, um, we are going to be raffling this painting off. We'll do that next week. So one of you who's watching or has been watching over the last couple of weeks, we'll, we'll do a raffle. We'll pull a name out of a, out of a bowl tomorrow, uh, next week. And um, once the painting is photographed and all put together, we'll ship it out to you. So you'll, you'll get to own an original. Um, so uh, Daniel is posting the, Daniel is currently posting the place for, or the rules or whatever it is you need to, uh, for, uh, to submit your name. Please just one entry each person, right? So if you've already put your name in, then you're in the pot. Uh, if you haven't already, please feel free to do that. Um, again, so I've got the value blocked in. I've left a little bit of room in here because it's, it's darker up in here. I've left a little breathing room in, in here because it's very dark back in here. And now I'm just gonna, just gonna manage my edges a little bit. Right, and that's all I'm doing, right? We're always, I'm always talking about value, like in grayscale, value and edge. So I've got my value down in the shape that I want it. Now I'm gonna manage the edges. Right now the edges are all relatively sharp. So now I'm gonna go in and I'm going to soften some of the edges, not all of them, to the degree that I need them to be softened to give the impression of the face as I want it. constantly wiping my brush because again, if the brush gets loaded up with paint, I'm no longer in control of it. And again, constantly moving back and forth. My eyes are constantly moving back and forth between the reference material and the painting. Generally, I'll spend maybe three or four seconds here, then three or four seconds here. I don't go from here for three seconds and then spend two minutes painting. I can't remember that long what it is that I'm trying to move over. Right, and so, um, and again, I, I spend a lot of time talking and not painting when I do these. Um, another thing <clears throat> when you're doing this, I'm not trying to scoop up a piece of visual information and hold it in my eye and then move it over here and paint it with my hand. It's not how it works. What I'm doing when I'm looking here is I'm trying to understand what I'm seeing. I take that understanding, now that's in here. Now I don't need the reference because I understand what I'm trying to do here, what I'm trying to say visually, so I can paint it. A great way to describe this is if I describe a scene to you, and I just want you to listen, I want you to think about this. If I describe a scene to you, I have a ball that is one inch in diameter. To the right of the ball, there is a one inch gap. 
and to the right of that is a two inch ball. To the right of that is a two inch gap, and then to the right of that is a three inch ball. Right, so a one inch ball with a one inch gap, two inch ball, two inch gap, three inch ball. Based on that description, I assume just pretty much anybody could draw that, right? If you had, if you, if you could, and again, I'm not talking about, you know, you know, you can use a, a compass and, you know, you can, you can actually measure it out and do it. Like anybody could do that, given a few minutes to take their time if they had the right tools, without ever having a picture they're copying, right? And the reason they can do it is because they understand the description. They understand that the balls go from one inch to two inch to three inches, and the gaps between them are the size of the ball to the left of the gap, right? And so if you understand that, when you draw it, you don't need to constantly go, go back to the reference material because you understand what it is you're trying to represent. And so when I'm looking at the photograph, I'm not trying to just kind of capture in my, in my eye what I'm seeing and then put it over here. I'm trying to understand why it looks the way that it looks, what's going on, and then take that understanding and create an illusion of what I understand when I move it over here. So it's not just a road exercise of scooping up a piece of information from a photo and dropping it into the painting, but having some understanding of what it is. Now, sometimes you can't, like if you don't understand any anatomy, you may not understand exactly what you're looking at, but you can, you can explain it to yourself in a way, even as an abstract. You can, you can formulate it in a way so that uh, the language that you have in your head gives you enough information to then replicate what you want over here without holding the visual information. The visual information doesn't stick. So if you understand it, an, another, a great, um, a great, another great way to explain this, they did a, um, a study with, a, with, I think it was 12 chess masters. And what they did is they took the chessboard and they moved the chessboard through, say, 20 moves. And then they brought in these 12 chess masters, they gave them two minutes to study the board. Or maybe it was one minute. They then cleared the board and the chess masters were asked one at a time to put the pieces back where they went, where they, where they originally were. And across the board, every one of the chess masters was able to put every single piece back exactly where it was. 100% of the, the chess masters and 100% of the pieces, not one error. They then did the same thing, but instead of putting the chessboard together by going through moves, they randomly placed pieces. The same chess masters came in, they had the same amount of time to look at it, they cleared the board, and not one of them was able to re replicate the board that was in front of them. And the reason was that in the first scenario, they actually understood how the board got to where it was. They understood. In the second one, they couldn't make sense of it, so they were trying to memorize where the pieces were, and they couldn't. That is the value of understanding. And so you can spend 10 minutes looking at a photograph, a piece of a photograph to get an understanding, and then 10 seconds to make the right marks because it's based on what you now understand. The more you do that, the better you'll be at making art. Again, just I, I, anything not to paint. <laughs> the, the grand master portrait I did, I think we, we estimated that it was, it's 85 hours long and I think I painted for about 30. <laughs> Just like 55 hours of me without even a brush in my hand. Pretty funny. <clears throat> but again, like, I think these things, these things are just as important as like, what paint you use and what brush you're using and how you move the paint around. These are, these are ideas and they have broad application well outside of making art. These are like, they're, they're they're fundamental life skills in a lot of way, uh, in a lot of ways. Understanding how the world around us works, how our brain processes information, like is this, it does, it applies to everything. Like understanding, understanding yourself and how you work, right? We don't, we don't, we don't come with a, an instruction book, but these are things that they're figuring out as as science and technology are growing, and they're 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 getting a better sense of of how our brains function, how they do what they do. And so a lot of these things apply, our visual stimulation, a third of our brain is dedicated to a visual processing, if I remember correctly, I think it's a third. So understanding the visual end of things is, it's so complex, and, but it's what we use for this. And if we can understand that, it, makes, it helps us to understand a lot of other things about how our brain is processing information, right? And you know, a lot of people, they don't realize, but being good at art requires 
some grounding in physics, physiology, neuroscience, like these things all apply. The more you know about these things, the easier it is to craft an illusion that fools people when they look at your work. And that's really what we're doing here. We're crafting an illusion, hopefully one that the person viewing the painting, that their brain is unable to break apart and see as, as an illusion, that they, they basically they, they buy into the illusion because it's that strong. But the more you understand about how the brain processes that information, the more powerful you are at building those illusions. There's a great show that was done a couple of years back called Brain, I think it was Brain Games. I think it was on, I think it was on PBS. Um, anyway, uh, the first show goes into a lot of this. Um, a lot of the things that, again, really valuable information for how our brain processes visual stimulation. It's great, it's great information as an artist. Now, of course, there's a lot more, there's a lot more that you have to get into, but that, it, that will open, open your eyes to just how, how powerful, um, when done properly, how powerful an illusion can be. Right, and since we're in the business of crafting illusions, that's a good thing to know. Again, I put this down and I'm going to go in and just manage my edges. Some of this is just scrubbing away. Some of it is creating gradients. Some of it I want sharp. And I just really, it jumps out now. All right, I got a question for you, Kevin. Yes. So this is from um, T.M. Yancey, one of our Evolve students. Okay. I'm not sure what her, her or his first name is. Um, I'm in block two. My question is, if we need to put a highlight or a reflection on a gradient area, which value do you base the half step on? Um. To the best of my knowledge, you should never have to do that. The gradients stand on their own. Your reflections will be on the shadowed side of the object. Your highlights will be on the lit side of the object. There shouldn't be anything going on inside of the reflections. Now, if the object's not perfectly smooth, you may get little variations of lighter and darker areas. The gradient may, buy, may not be really smooth, but the way that you've been trained, right, the way that you've been trained, oh, she said block two. So you, you have a terrible lighting scenario in your studio is what that is. You have a light probably over you that's shining into the box. So you're getting reflection there, right? You have a light on one side, which is lighting the object, a shadow on the other, and then you have another light where you're working that's shining into the box, basically putting highlights inside of your, your gradients. Block your light and that will go away. You'll be able to then see clean gradients. Um, but you shouldn't, so when we're working, you've been given a directive that reflections only happen in the shadows, highlights only happen in the lights. The gradients is kind of no man's land. You don't put anything in there because what you would do is you would disrupt, you would disrupt what we use to describe three-dimensional form. Once you start breaking that up, everything will start to flatten out again. So inside of the gradients, you never put anything, but you're running into a lighting situation. You have a light back here somewhere behind you or over you that's, reflect, that's, that's lighting or at least giving some glare and reflecting off of your objects. So just block the light, put a little drape or something in front of it and that problem will go away immediately. So that's a great question. You know, when we, we show you in the program how to set these things up, but it's like, you know, I'm showing you in a space like this. So in everybody in their own little space, it's a little bit hard to, um, to necessarily perfect it. And so it's a really good question. You, if you're getting that kind of a glare, this is for anybody who's in the program who's doing this, if you're getting glare in the middle of things, like in your gradients, it means that there's an additional light source shining in on those objects. You just gotta block it so that you just put a, a block in front of it 
a little drape or a piece of cardboard, something, so that there's no light shining out from out here in there. Oh, that's a good one. It's a good thing I realized it was blocked too. Yeah, kind of I would have clarified mind. for you. So, here. So, and again, I'm just kind of working down this edge. And again, you see, like sometimes when I stop talking, I'm doing major calculation, paying attention to what's going on. And I'm looking at values out here and seeing how they relate all the way up in here. So my eyes are moving back and forth, trying to make sure, did I assess this properly? Am I building this right? So there's a lot of calculation. I can't talk I'm, because I'm thinking these things through. When I start talking, it's because I figured something out and now I can just kind of roll through it and paint it. And so you'll see, like in the times when, I'm, when I get really quiet, it's because I'm actually calculating. Right? And I think, like, you can't see me calculating, but that's how you'll know that, I'm, that I've, stopped, I, I've stopped talking because all of my mental energy needs to be on solving a problem in front of me. And that's a good thing to know because, again, like, you can't see. Now, I heard somebody describe this, so I thought it was pretty cool. Like, you know, if you look at an athlete, like a world class athlete, you can tell they are a world-class athlete by the, by the way they look, right? Just the, the, the body fat, the musculature, the, the way they move, they're fluid when they move, they're graceful, they're like all of these kinds of things. As an artist, you could, you could look like anything because all of the things, all of the, 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 the power that you have is in here. It's hidden, just like a guy like Bill Gates. Like if Bill Gates were an athlete, if he was an athlete instead of what he is, he'd be like, like we'd, just, we'd all just be sitting around marveling at him, right? Same thing with like a Steve Jobs. You know, these guys, what makes them so powerful is invisible to us. And the same with art, right? It's like it's a, the ability to process thought, to creatively problem solve. And so as an artist, like that's where our strengths are. And so they're not visible, we don't see them. But when you're doing this, like you can tell when I shut up, <laughs> when I shut up, it's because I am committing a lot of energy to thinking through and calculating, is this the right shade, is the right shape? How does, I'm, I'm figuring out what's going on. And so um, even with all of my experience, I mean, 30 years I've been doing this, I can't talk and do that at the same time. I can calculate it pretty quickly and then get back to talking, but when I shut up, it's because 100% of my brain power is being committed to figuring out what's in front of me. And again, you can't see it, but now you'll know when I stop talking, that's what's going on. All right, and you can tell like when you see me work, like if you've seen like the, the Grand Master portrait, I'm able to talk through most of what I do because I know what I'm doing and I'm not, I kind of stage the painting in such a way that I can move methodically through it and I'm not being tripped up by unknowns. But this, because I'm, this paint is not coming out the same value, it's, tri it's forcing me to engage differently when normally I'd be able to just roll through this without a second thought. It's, I'm being forced now to pay much greater attention at this stage than I would normally have to. Right? And again, once I have this down, everything should then roll from there pretty effortlessly. Right? It's just getting this thing in place because this is where the, this is where the trip up is. Once this is done, I'll have eliminated the, the, the problem and I'll be on track to just roll through the painting as planned. Right, I'm kind of working my way around. I'm, gonna, I'm coming up here. I'm gonna co I'll come back down here and resolve this. I'm just blocking it in where I think it goes. I'm gonna come up into here and into the eye socket. 
Then I'll do the nose, the philtrum, and then I'll start, I'll start managing my edges. And I know from last week, this actually dried darker than it was when I first put it down, which is interesting. I remember I put it down and it dissolved into this. The next day when I came back, it was much darker. It was this big a jump. So this stuff may actually wind up when it dries being this shade. Uh, if that is the case, I'm not, I'm not really sure why. And I have to kind of investigate that because it shouldn't be happening. But I do remember last week that I did have that after it dried the next day. I did notice that there was a, um, a significant darkening in the paint. And so the, what I'm running into that's kind of tripping me up here, what's causing me to have to think so much is that I don't know if this paint is going to darken on me. And so I'm trying to make sure that, I am, that I'm giving myself a little bit of latitude that if it does, that it doesn't ruin the painting for me. And if it doesn't, that I'm leaving the painting in a good place for that last stage. So I'm having to find like a comfortable middle ground to put this in that isn't gonna mess me up Either way the paint goes. Got some questions for you. Yes. From Kelly Worley. Do you hey, ever Kelly. paint anything with words? How do you handle doing letters, even your signature? Um, well, I, I actually just finished a painting that had lots and lots of letters in it. Um, you know what? You, you paint it just like anything else. You have to be meticulous. You have to be very careful when you do it. Um, I use rulers, and not a ruler that would go flat. I have it elevated by, like, say, um, maybe in like soda caps, like from a bottle of soda. And so it gives me maybe a one inch elevation. And I'll put the ruler down, and it's elevated. And then I'll just run the brush along the ruler, so that gives me absolutely crisp lines. The paint generally has to be has to be much thinner, so it flows off the brush almost like ink. But um, that lettering is a skill set all of its own. Um, but again, it's just, it's just more of the same. When we're doing this, it's, it's just more of the same, right? If you're doing lettering, the lettering is a value, co a color value against whatever the background is, a color value, and the edges that marry them are all sharp. That's all it is, right? So we're always talking value, color, edge. Whatever the color and value of the letter is compared to the la color and value of the background, and then it's just edge management. So you fill the letter very carefully just like you would any painting, you fill the shape that you want very carefully, making the edges nice and crisp, and then there are just no gradients. That's all. It's not a departure from what you're already learning. Another question? Yes. How much time would you spend planning a painting compared to actually painting it? Well, that's actually a really great question. Um, so every painting is different, right? Like complexity, this stuff all contributes to the answer. Like how complex is it? Is it the subject matter you've seen before? Or is it completely new and you are, you're gonna basically be inventing your, your approach to it as you work on that particular painting? There's a lot that, there's a lot that really kind of factors in. And so, what I would say is that I don't start painting until I know where I'm going with the painting, right? It doesn't make sense. Like, let's say you have to go somewhere and it's imperative that you get there. Would you get in your car and start driving before somebody sent you the address? And the answer is no, because you could wind up driving three hours in the wrong direction, right? You need the address. You need your GPS to show you how to get there in order to get there. And so when I'm doing a painting, I don't start a painting until I know how I'm going to progress through it. And that doesn't mean that I know from start to finish, but I have a plan. I'm always flexible because I know that nothing ever really goes to plan. But 
when the painting starts to go off the rails, I know because I know what road I'm supposed to be on. And if I wind up on, on some, you know, off in the weeds somewhere, I know there's no asphalt under my tires. I stop my car. I kind of look around for the road, drive back to the road and go from there, right? And it's just, um, it, it's no different, you know, again, like, you know, it's a, using the car is a great analogy, right? Again, I know where I want the painting to be. I know what the destination is. I have the tools to get there, right? But I can't, I can't, I have to figure out like which tools at which time, right? Am I making a left hand turn first? Am I making a right hand turn? How fast am I going? Like how far do I have to drive before I make a turn, right? All of those things, they all, they all play into it. And so um, there is no given amount of time for any painting. I've done small paintings where I've had the painting, I've had the, the, um, the idea, the subject matter all ready to go and I'll spend three weeks working it out in my head before I put a mark down. I actually have a, a painting I did of a, um, of a horse. It's a girl sitting on a horse, a big painting. And when I did the photography, I wound up with this beautiful tail. The tail just kind of swished and snapped and it was just beautiful. And when I saw the photograph, I was in front of the family that, um, that, that had commissioned the piece. And when I first saw the photograph, I thought, wow, that tail looks incredible. And out of my mouth comes, I'm definitely getting that tail in the painting. And as the words came out of my mouth, I wish I could have kind of grabbed them and pulled them back because I had no idea how I was going to manage that. Absolutely no idea. But once I said it, I, I was pretty much locked into it. And so I actually spent, I spent about three days with that tail sitting on the, on the canvas untouched, trying to figure out how to resolve it. And at about, it took me, like I said, about three days and I finally figured out how I thought it would work. Now, I didn't know for sure because I'd never painted anything like it. And it was gonna be done in layers. But in the end, the tail took me about maybe two hours to paint. And it's a lot of ground. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big painting and it's a lot of, it's a lot of um, hair. But it only took me about two hours to paint it but three days to figure out how to paint it. And when I started painting it, I wasn't absolutely sure that it would work, but I had a good plan. It was like, I know I have to get from where I am to New York, so east. Doesn't matter where you are in the US, east first, right? That's, and so I had a direction like that. I'm gonna go east until I hit water, and then I'll figure out from there if I need to go north or south. I didn't have an absolute map like you, like, you know, going on Route 78 and like, oh, I didn't have that, but I knew generally the direction I needed to take this. And then I fine tuned at each stage, thinking about where I wanted this stage to end to prep me for the next stage. And then I'd be like, oh, well this stage, now that I'm here, oh, I should do a little bit more because I'm not going to do what I was planning. I'll do something else, but that's going to be the, that'll be the next move. And then when I finished that, and I could see after that, I would do the next thing. But when I got to the end of that second stage, it was like, okay, maybe what I was planning wasn't perfect. Let me kind of course correct it a little bit. You have to be flexible in this as you work. But, uh, but yeah, that horse painting, I wish I had access to it. I don't even know where it is. It's online somewhere. Um, it's online somewhere. Art Renewal Center, I think. I don't know. Anyway, anyway. Um, but just suffice it to say, like these things, Sometimes it takes more time to think it th than to figure it out than it does to actually do it. And that's fine, right? Because if I went in and I painted the thing, I probably would have ruined the painting if I hadn't thought it through and figured it out and had a plan. Plans, plans are, are everything. <clears throat> All right. Well, I gotta say, this, the, the, the value issues here are really tripping me up. Um, they're really causing me some, some um, difficulties here. So I'm actually gonna be overwriting some of these things and accepting that I, they, may, they may require significant adjustment in the next pass, but that's okay. You know, like not everything goes exactly as you plan. And you know, if that's the case, it's fine. You just, I'll correct it in the next pass. I'll fix it later. And then if that happens to be the case, then what'll happen is you'll get to see me fix the problem. That's, there's a lesson in that as well, right? Not really concerned about it. That's, that's just what it'll become. I don't, I don't mind that.
You know, I'm confident in whatever happens here, next week I'll be able to make it what I want it to be. Um, right, and that, that confidence comes from just having done this so many times. Um, I'll be able to make whatever corrections I need next week um, if, this, if this doesn't work out. And again, I, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure what's going on here. I'm actually, I've never seen this. This has never happened to me before. This is new. So um, just kind of managing it on the fly here. And that's fine. I mean, again, like this could have happened to me in my studio working on a commissioned painting. Um, the, last thing, the last thing this painting needs is for me to break down and start crying because things aren't going the way I planned. Right? Life doesn't work. Life is not like that. You know? Things never go to plan. What's the saying? Man makes plans, God laughs. I think that's the saying, right? So, so I've got a lot of this stuff in now. I'm just going to dissolve my edges. And again, for me, the big thing is leaving no edge between the shade I just put down and the one that I believe is that shade from last week. Because if they dry exactly the same, I want them to, if they dry to be the same shade, I want them to, to blend beautifully. And if they don't dry to be the same shade, I want that edge to be so soft that I don't even notice it. Again, I'll just knock this down just a little bit, and then I'll wipe my brush, constantly wiping my brush in between this. Now, um, when we teach uh, block one, block two, block three, uh, even block four in Evolve, I make a point. You never, ever, ever make a gradient using a dry brush. The technique I'm using here is actually a block five technique where we absolutely use a dry brush to do this. So I don't want anybody jumping back into block three and replicating the way I'm doing this. It won't work. It'll just make a mess if you work. And it's important for me to say, like, I try not to, I try not to make these videos around the Evolve students because we have a lot of people that are not connected to Evolve that are watching them. But I do need to make that point because I don't want Evolve students to think that what I'm doing here, maybe they missed something in the video and they're allowed to do this. Block five is where you would see blending without paint on your brush. This is uh, actually, it's like bacon shadows which are block five technique. Question from Mary Jo. Yes. Are you enjoying painting on gesso board as much as canvas? So I actually like working on panel. It's taken me a little getting used to. I haven't done it in a long time. Um, the canvas that we were working on, I kind of hate it, <laughs> to be honest. It's. Um, it's the stuff, that, the stuff that I do a lot of these things on. I work on, when I paint, I work on a really, really beautiful linen. And it's quadruple primed and it's just, it is just an absolute pleasure to work on. And it's stretched over a handmade stretch. I mean, it's just, I mean, these are professional commissions. And so the materials are really high end and they are, they're just a pleasure to work with. And I would take that linen over any, sub, any other substrate. But if I had to do canvas, like the canvas that we normally use, that we learn on, or a panel like this, I would go with the panel, at, the, at least for these techniques. Not for everything. Um, I would say block, blocks one through four, what you're doing, the canvas that you're working on is great. Um, again, as you get into some of these other techniques, much more expensive materials are gonna be nicer to work with. But that's, you know, that's like a car, you know? A Ford Focus, it's a car. If you want to spend money and get a nicer car, you know, a 7 Series BMW, much smoother on the road. But it's like you got to spend the money, right? A, a, a good piece of linen, like, like Art Fix linen, is incredible. It's $3,000 a roll. Unless you're being paid big money for your work, you don't use it. Handmade stretchers, they're expensive. They're cut to order. You don't use those unless, unless somebody else is basically footing the bill. And so um, for you guys working with the materials you work with, that's like, they're great materials to, like obviously you got an old Holland paint or handmade brushes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. What we send you guys is pretty incredible. Um, but there is, at least on the canvas end of it, there is better. There's much better. 
panel. I like this panel, but I'm also like what I like and what you like, what fits me and what fits you, they're going to be different, right? Just because I like something doesn't mean you will. You know, um, there are things that I eat that, you know, I mean, look, I eat McDonald's. Like, and I know a lot of people do, but some people, like, you put that in your mouth, it'll make you sick. <laughs> you know, it's just because it's terrible. But, um, but it's like there are things that I like and they fit because they fit me. Just because I like this panel doesn't mean you will. Just because I can work on it and it's really kind of seamless for me doesn't mean it will be for you. It's actually quite slippery. The paint doesn't grab to it. And so I spent my entire illustration career working on surfaces like this, so it's only taken me a little bit of time to settle back in. There's a learning curve on this, like with anything else. When you switch from canvas to this, the paint is going to be all over the place. You use tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of paint on this. If you use the amount of paint that you use on canvas, it would be all over. I mean, it would just be a mess. So again, like for me, what I like, I don't want you to take that, like I'm enjoying working on this, but I don't want you to take that as you should try it. Right now, while you're in Evolve, work only with what we give you. Eventually, you want to go and try ampersand panels and things like that. It's, it's great to do. For the program, stick with what you have. I mean, we handpick these materials for a reason. And you should know by now, within Evolve, nothing is accidental. Everything that we do, everything I say, everything we show you, what we send you, it's, it's all been thought through, okay? And one more question. Yes. Um, back to our Evolve student, Yancy. If an object is all black, do you still paint the light side, extreme light, and the shadow side, extreme shadow? It looks very odd, block two. Okay, so the answer to that question is definitively no. Um, now, if you have a black object, and it's really shiny, you're not gonna be able to just, you're probably not gonna see anything but the shadow and the highlight. Not the light, but the highlight. So get rid of the really shiny objects, right? A lot of the students in the program, like we tell you, don't put glass. Don't use glass because there's no shadow and light on glass. It's see-through. People do it anyway. Highly reflective subjects don't show you clean light and shadow, especially if they're black or white. Very, very hard to read. So put objects up there that are not, that are not, um, that are not making it impossible to use the program as it's been given to you. Now, those things, you're going to be taught how to paint them later on. But in block two, it sounds like you're literally staging the worst scenario possible to make a painting. Simple objects, like I say this in the videos all the time, a can, a ball. I don't want to see necessarily like, you know, glazed figurines. You don't need to do that in order to develop a skill. You just, you just don't. You know, I use this, I use this analogy all the time. You don't need to be thrown out into the middle of the ocean during a hurricane in order to learn how to swim. You can do it in four feet of water in a heated pool indoors, right? Why would you want to learn out in the ocean like that when you could get comfortable with it in an environment that's safe? You can put your feet down if you swallow up water, right? When you're learning to do this, everything that you put up on the table should be just a little bit of a challenge, not some in insane jump forward because you want to make a painting to put into a museum somewhere, right? It's not about making paintings for the purpose of anything other than learning. And so when you put something up on the table that is, that's so challenging, that there's literally, you can't see the shadow in the light because the reflections are so bright. Obviously, this is probably not an object you should be working on. It doesn't fit within the scope of what you're being asked to do, right? And so objects that are simple, that are not highly reflective, at least not to start. Again, if you put something up on the table and you immediately see, I can't see a shadow or a light, I'm only seeing like black on one side and a highlight on the other, it's not the right object for this stage of the education. It, later on, it'll be fine, but not at this stage. Simple subject matter is all you need. Proportional drawings, this is an example. A proportional drawing of, let's say, a, um, a bust of Abraham Lincoln is comprised of proportional measurements, right? That's, right, you have a standard unit of measure, an object that you're going to use to measure everything else. And so that standard unit of measure will be used against the, the, the bust of, of Abraham Lincoln. The only tool you're using is proportional measuring. 
So do you think that that will make you better at proportional measuring when you're learning than having three cans of different sizes and a ball that you're measuring with? Right, because you're doing the same thing. This object against those to see how they relate to each other. So what does it matter if it's insanely complex or relatively simple? Right? It doesn't make a difference. But the difference is, one of them is so challenging, the chances are you will fail. And in the process of failing, you will not get an education. The other way is straightforward and it's simple, and it allows you to become very comfortable with a process. And once you're comfortable with it, you can easily apply it to any subject matter. Right? And so keep your subject matter simple. If you can't see a clean shadow and a clean light, switch out the object. Right? You're picking the objects you're putting on the table Make sure that you're getting both a clean light and a shadow. Make sure you're getting gradients, you're getting form shadows and cast shadows. Make sure all of the components are there. You're in control of this. Be thoughtful about what you put on the table to make sure all of the things you put on the table allow you to apply the lessons that you are trying to learn. Proportional drawing within your ability. And what I say is like, whatever your ability level is, nudge up just a little bit into a place that's uncomfortable so that you're growing. But don't, don't go after something that is a monumental challenge. Baby steps. You have the rest of your life to baby step your way to these things that are monumental. Stay with the simple things while you're developing your skills. Produce excellent, simple things. And you'll have much better foundations than if you fail at complex things. And you'll have a lot less frustration, which is one of the big killers of, of the desire to actually sit down and do this. And here again, I'm just trying to soften these edges. I'm sure there's going to be lots of little bits of texture in here next week when we come back in. Um, just, I'm just, because these things will only blend so much, I'm thinking. And if this value shift doesn't, if it doesn't surrender itself and, and darken like what's down, then I'm definitely going to be seeing some variations in here at these edges. And again, you can see, I mean, I'm not rattled by this. It's just it's the nature of what I'm dealing with in this painting. I don't know why it's happening, but I'm just rolling with it. There's not much I can do, right? So I'm just rolling with it, and I will make whatever changes I need later on. Like, I'm already seeing what's underneath kind of making adjustments at these edges, which tells me this, is, this paint is probably going to get drawn down into the board, and it will darken, which would be great if it does that. Um, that's, that's really what I'm hoping for. But I'm seeing on the edges where these shades, are, where, like I can see it here, and I can see it in here, where the paint, where I ended last time, um, I can see that there's a variation on those, edge, those edges as the paint is starting to set up. But again, I don't know exactly what this is going to look like when it dries based on that. I can, only, I can only guess at this point. So again, trying to, trying to find a middle ground that will allow me, no matter which way it falls, will allow me to recover the painting next week. Right? And I may wind up having to do a lot more next week than I originally planned based on this, but that's fine. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Again, one of the fun things about painting is the problem solving, like, at least for me. Doing it in a live stream, not always so much fun. <laughs> be nice, like in my, own, in my own studio, in my own time, if I run into this, it would not be a big deal. It's just more of a curiosity as to why it's happening um, than anything else. And it could just be the panel. I'm not accustomed to working on panel, and maybe just the, the, the way that I prep the panel is just drawing paint, it's drawing the, um, the, the oil into the, um, into the gesso that's down, and in doing that, the, the less, it's leaving more pigment on the surface and less oil, and the paint darkens. Just like when you put medium in the paint, the paint gets a little bit lighter. Maybe as it's being drawn down, I'm losing some of that extra light. And what that is is just the, the, you have these, these dots of pigment in oil. And if you take the oil out, the pigment, there's, no, there's nothing between it, so it gets closer together, and it would darken. There's less light permeability in the paint. And so, again, 
I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm, I'm, I am trying to figure it out as I'm sitting here working, but I'm, I'm also trying to manage how I make this painting work no matter which way it falls as it dries. Question for you. Yes. Regarding the transfer process, do yes. you ever use charcoal? Uh, in the past, we used to, but carbon paper is so much better. It's so much better. It's, first of all, it's not messy. Um, it just comes off a roll. You know, like if you want to use charcoal, you have to like do a drawing on a piece of paper and then coat the back of it with charcoal and then put it up. Unless you're talking about actually just drawing with charcoal, but again, that's really messy. If you're doing transfers, charcoal's a very, very mm. messy way of going about it. Um, and for me, and again, we used to do that in here before we were able to get these large rolls of carbon paper. But now that we have access to the large rolls of carbon paper, uh, I, I don't see any sense in um, in making the school filthy when we have a way of doing this that doesn't that doesn't create that problem. But it, you can do that. I mean, it's 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 an effective tool. Like I said, for me, I'm just I, I try to be practical. Like I don't want to I don't want to spend five hours cleaning up if I can spend one. I don't want to have charcoal powder all over my studio if I don't need to. Well, I, you know, I, I try to keep everything very simple. The less moving parts, the less wasted time, the better. And so charcoal to me, like doing charcoal, just it leads to, it leads to major messes and major cleanups. Both things that I don't want to have to do. So easier to just sidestep it since there is a company that makes a material that allows me to sidestep it. Now, mind you, bef like I said, before we found this, this material, before it was around, we did everything that way. Um, but once we found this, this, these large rolls, Richeson makes these large 24-inch rolls of transfer paper. And they're great. They do everything we need them to do. Um, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't sub out the charcoal if, these, if the, um, the, the carbon paper didn't do everything we want. But they do. Uh, it, it does. And so since it's, it's easy to work with, there's no cleanup, there's no mess, and it, doesn't, and it gives me an equal, um, equal finished product, there's no reason why I, wouldn't, why I wouldn't go in that direction. It just makes sense to me. Got a question from Nicholas Propes. Yes, hey Nicholas. I wonder what would be the difference if you glaze over this grayscale with color compared to the more monochrome color painting we do in block six? Well, uh, so Nicholas, what I would say to you, because right, you're pretty far along, why don't you take one of your grayscale paintings and try it, right? You have grayscale paintings, nice finished ones, even like your vacant shadows. Try it. See what happens, right? You don't have to wonder. I'm not going to paint in, I'm not going to glaze in color over this, so you're not going to see it here. But you can do it at home. You have, you're far enough through the program, take one of your paintings that's, that's sitting there and just test it. See how it goes. What I would say is that you're probably going to have to build some opaques into your glazes, right? Be prepared for that. But give it a shot. Worst that'll happen is you'll ruin a painting. They just practice paintings, so shouldn't be a big deal. Right? They're all just part of your education, so this is another opportunity to be educated. Right? Again, like one of the things, like when you're learning, like you don't want to treat these, these pieces of art like they're precious. Because if you do, you'll be afraid to do anything that'll ruin anything that looks nice. And that's, that's really counter to growing. Right? There have to be some, some educated risks involved to push you outside of your comfort zone a little here and there as you work, because outside of your comfort zone are the things you don't fully understand. Right? And so you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay putting these things at risk as you're growing. 
Now, obviously, like, if, you know, if you're taking professional commissions, you can't do that quite so much. You have to be a little bit more thoughtful because you have to be able to deliver. But the thing is, while you're still working on things that are exercises while you're learning, take the risks. Take the risks now while, while there's nobody sitting there with a deadline and an expectation of a particular painting being delivered. Right? Coming back, back around to the, the, uh, the whole like paint situation that you're trying to figure out here. Yes. Um, DD is wondering, could the paint that is lighter be from a different batch, sort of like house paint? No, no. First of all, no, not with old Holland. These, these are spot-on matches. But this is the same paint. These are the same tubes I used last week. So no. Um, but yeah, with old Holland, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, definitely not. Okay, so I um, think I'm going to stop that value there. Just want to make sure all of my edges are managed just in case. So just in case I get the worst case scenario in my result uh, when it dries. But I think, I think we're looking pretty good. Um, I'm just going to pull this down just a little bit. You got a shout out from Sumi Who? Duta. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, she's one of our students. She said, um, just wanted to thank you for everything, how much you care during explaining our, how much you care explaining during the process. And that way we learned so much seeing you paint. And she also had a question to go with along with this. Yes. So um, she said today, as we can easily get printouts of any size and at its proportion, such as like from like a transfer image, um, how likely will we be using proportional drawing techniques after I am done in Evolve? Okay, so it's a, it's a great question. First of all, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Um, but it's a great question. So what you think of as proportional drawing is a lot more than that. So you think that proportional drawing is a lesson in how to see something and get its measurement. But actually what we're doing in, in all learning, not just art, but in all learning, your brain isn't a bucket where you learn something and it gets dropped in there like a coin. Your brain actually carves out physical um, neural pathways as you learn. When you're doing proportional drawing, it's not a proportional drawing neural pathway. It's a pathway for visual perception. Visual perception is used for color mixing. It's used for assessing temperature, edges. So each of the things, each of the stages in the program, what we're doing is actually we're beginning to develop neural pathways in a single direction. You think about, what do we do at first? We figure out what's a shadow and what's a light. We don't do that in normal life. We don't force our brain to figure that stuff out. So we break up whatever we see into what is in the shadows and what is in the light. We then take the shadows and we break them down, forcing our brain to start thinking about the differences and how they, these things relate. So then we do the same with the lights. And once we have that, we then start looking at the edges that marry each of these values together. Each one of these things is forcing your brain to make new pathways to learn, right, to, to actively perceive these things. They're not individual like a pathway for this and a pathway for that, but it is a pathway for perception. Once we've done that, then we start looking at proportional drawing, which is just a, a more complex version of it. How, re how big is this relative to that? Still relative. So those neural pathways become deep, become more carved, more, more, they become more prominent. And each one of them makes the next thing that comes easier to do because you are able to perceive things you couldn't before. You speak to anybody who's in block four of the program 
ask them about how they see things compared to how they saw things before they started the program, you'll, first of all, you'll see their face light up and they will start to tell you about how they were blind when they first started the program and what they're able to see everywhere they go, the colors and the temperatures, the, these variations, these things they were absolutely blind to. So like we open our eyes as babies and we, we see and we never stop to think about it unless we become injured, right? We, we never stop. Our eyes work, they work, that's it. So we actually view the world almost through our entire lives passively. It just goes by. We never break down what we see. As artists, we are trained to actually stop and break down and make sense of all of the visual stimulation that comes in. But that requires the development of neural pathways specifically for that purpose, for, for making sense of the visual stimulation in a way that is not used as a general process, right? Because our eyes are used to protect us from walking off cliffs and things like that. Training our eyes to give us much more information or for our brain to extract that information from the visual stimulation coming in is what this is all about. So even if you never do proportional drawing again after you finish this program, which I, I recommend not doing, I recommend every painting you do from a photograph that you spend a couple of days working from direct observation afterwards before the next photo. But if you choose after you finish the program to never paint from life ever again, neural pathways will have been de developed over the time while you were doing the technique that will strengthen all of your skill sets later. The more painting from direct observation you do, the better those perceptions become. And the reason is, when you work from a photograph, you're dealing in two-dimensional objects. And you're translating a two-dimensional photograph into a two-dimensional painting. When you paint or draw from direct observation, you are being, you're forcing your brain to take a three-dimensional space and compress it. There's a lot more calculation in that. And so then when you work from a two-dimensional photograph, your brain knows how to fill it back up and make it three-dimensional in your painting. Like my painting is actually more three-dimensional than the photograph, a lot more three-dimensional. The angle here doesn't show it, but um, the, the paintings are much more three-dimensional than the photographs because the, the, the photograph is like a flattened balloon. When I paint it, I blow and I fill it with air. It becomes three-dimensional here, or the illusion is. So again, you may, not, you may not ever draw from life again after the program, but the skills you develop by doing it in the program are going to be with you forever, and they're going to make you better at everything that comes. But again, I would recommend don't stop working from life. Between In the school, no matter where people are in the program, they do a painting from photographs, they do a couple of paintings from life. They do a painting from photographs, a couple of paintings from life. That way they're constantly developing those skills. They're constantly um, contributing to the development of those, those abilities to perceive. <clears throat> right, I just want to check this. So I said, I believe, This was out here. Right, so um, I'm going to go in. I'm just going to establish my brightest highlight here, just so I have it placed. And this is, this is just the, the, the highlight on the forehead. Right, and what that does is that allows me to now bridge this gap, not have to think about it too much. Like, I know where this is. I know what the value, what the goal is as far as a value, and I know where, the, where it's placed, what its shape is. Makes life a little bit easier for me. And I would say um, I'll come back around as I move into other areas and put, that, put those values in. Um, all right, so here, I feel like this kind of comes across like this. And now I can kind of start loosely painting a little bit here. Um, kind of pushing this across. Again, this is going to come up in here. All right, and here I'm just kind of pushing up into the hair, just trying to hint at what's going on here. I'm not rendering hair just trying to get some sense of its movement in here. And I'm 
just pushing this up into dry paint. All right, I'll soften the edges a little bit afterwards. And this stuff may be too light. It may need to be glazed in my next pass a little bit. And that's fine. Again, my, my value structure at this point is really kind of shot because of the, the situation that we've run into with the paint, uh, the, the paint drying this way. Um, but that's fine. Just, it'll be, it's manageable, right? And as long as I don't panic. But it seems like every time we do one of these live streams is going to be an issue. So here I've got the shade down. I'm just going to manage the edge. Now I'm working into wet paint on this edge. So it's pretty easy to dissolve. Again, any place where this hits wet paint, it breaks down very easily. And I just try to make sure that my edges are nice and nice and soft. Again, if I want to put a sharp edge in later on, easier to put in later than to take out a sharp edge that I have unintentionally um, left behind. <clears throat> So that's good now. I know this value is the lightest shade in here. So I'm just looking for places where I can get this little hit of extra light. Not too much, just a little bit here and there. Go back down to a dry brush. Just soften these edges. Again, I'm trying to make sure that I'm explaining some of what's going on in here. They're not just random strokes. The edges are very particular. Some are sharp, some are soft. I'm trying to be very careful to explain all these little ins and outs because they describe form. They describe turns in the form. Which edge is sharp, which edge is graded. Question for you. Yes. Do you learn how to take your own photos for reference in the Evolve program? Um, we, there's a lot of stuff that we have not gotten around to doing yet, um, that we have bounced around as things that will be in the program at some point. Again, if we can get to them, um, and, and I imagine we, we will at some point get to all of this stuff. Uh, but right now, our priority is in making sure that what is out already is the best that it can be. I mean, we've talked about this. I, I've mentioned this before. Like the current videos um, for Evolve are something like the 17th iteration, or at least block one is like the 17th iteration. Um, because we're constantly, constantly updating it to make sure that the entry point into the program is absolutely the best it can be. Because it, it really sets the trajectory for each student coming into the program. Right? If block one is really, really solid, it's a frictionless entry into the program. You build confidence and skill right away, and that momentum carries you. And so we've gone back and we've reworked it over and over and over. And even though we've talked about a block eight, a block nine, and 10, 11, and 12 that would have photography and some other things, those are, those are not priorities right now. 
the priorities are the fundamentals at the very beginning. But it is something we've bounced around. It is something that we've talked about doing. Um, we, we, we like the idea of it, but it's, it's just at this point, it's not a priority. Um, but I do imagine it will get done at some point uh, because it's important. Um, it's important. If you can't do your own photography, if you can't do your own, um, your own, get your own reference, you're kind of limited later on once you're done with the program. So it is something we will get around to. Even if it's just a, even if it's just a quick uh, video that we throw together that's not like another block, but that shows you how to do it. Um, but also, you could also go out and take photogra a photography course, a basic studio photography course, and you'll learn everything you need. Probably a million times more than you need. Um, doing, taking the photographs is not a complex thing. But yeah, I mean, I do hope that we will get around to it. It is the intention at some point, but it's not on the calendar at the moment. Okay, and again, as I'm getting, as I'm getting into these areas, I want to drop my highlights in, right? I've got outlines for my highlights, and so like in my transfer, I've got, I've got marks, and so I don't want to run up against them and then potentially lose them, and so for me, putting them in now, and again, I recommend this. So what I'm doing here is what I'm recommending for you to do, right? Um, I don't actually really paint this way. I am showing you a way of painting that will yield a result, right? I keep saying that, like, this is for you. If you can take this, glean something from it, it will hopefully make it easier for you to get a much nicer result. It's going to upscale the quality of your deliverables. But it's limited, right? It's limited. So I'm trying to do what I think would be best for you if you do this at home. Right, so like I wouldn't put the highlighting because I don't really care where my drawing is. I would place it after I built out all my other values. But t for the sake of making sure that highlight stays exactly where it belongs, putting it in like this is actually makes a lot of sense. And then I'll basically just paint around it. Got a nice comment here. As a noob, I've been trying to put the lessons from the free videos, mini course, and live videos into practice, and immediately I can see major improvements, like more depth and realism. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that this stuff is of value to you. I mean, if you're getting that much out of those, those, those free videos, the program is going to be, uh, going to be pretty incredible for you. I'm assuming he's a stu is he a student? Or is he just somebody doing uh, going through the free stuff? Um, I'm not sure. He's got the initials KR, so it's hard to tell. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, if you're if you're not in the program, I'm glad to hear that those things are are proving to be of value. And if you are in the program, as you get further in, what you're going to learn is going to blow away what you're picking up from the free videos. The free videos. I mean, obviously, we can only do so much. We're trying, to use, we're trying to spread this information around, but the free videos, it, 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 they're really limited. We have limited resources for that. It's more to find people who are interested in the program, who are interested in a, in a full education. But at the same time, we're trying to inform a little bit as well. Um, Again, just trying to get in here and figure out where these things go. I'll tell you, it is a real challenge with this the way it is. Um, I'm having to calculate everything. So, how are we doing on time? It is 9.34. Okay.
I think we're doing okay on time. I always say that, don't I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's um, a mad dash at the end. So KR chimed back in. He said, I hope to join the program someday. I'm not a student yet. I'm very new into painting. Three months. Well, good luck. Good luck. Like I said, I mean, we're constantly putting out new resources. I mean, like these videos are great. Um, they should give you a lot of information if you can try to replicate this. Um, but good luck. Good luck. And, you know, you can reach out if you need. Um, we have, like, through our, if you're involved with a successful artist group, if you have questions as you're doing stuff, you can always reach out there. Even if, like, Daniel, Daniel monitors these um, videos after they go up, so any comments that go in there. So if after watching one of these, if you try to do it and you find that um, you're getting a pretty good result but it's not really pulling together, drop your painting out there, right? You're going to post a photograph. Can we do that? Are we able to do that? No. There's, there's a way to reach out to you, right? Not anymore. Uh, you could reach out to me through hello at Evolve Artists and just ask yeah, so, to speak to me directly. Yeah, so you can reach Daniel at hello at Evolve Artists. Again, not for just anything, but like if you take this technique and you try it and... Oh, actually, um, I do have a link that's open to anyone where people can submit their art for a critique. Okay, why don't you set that up? Let's so, just post yeah. that. Yeah, that way, and again, like you have to understand, like, like, we're, like all of us with what we're doing with Evolve, we're all very busy. So I ask that you don't just send, you know, crayon drawings and, you know, as crazy as that sounds. But if you, if you play around with this technique and you formulate some questions, you can reach out to us. If we can make the time, we'd be happy to talk to you and, and kind of give you some guidance. We, we know that Evolve isn't the right fit for everybody for one reason or another. The whole point of us doing this is, is, to, make, is to make this accessible. Right, and so it's not just about, well, you're paying customers, so you get this stuff. If we can help you, we're, that's what we're about. So if you put in the work, right, if we see that you've done the work, we'll be happy to make some time and speak with you. And again, I remember when I was doing my assessment, this value was this one. So I'm, I'm establishing my brightest highlight already down in here. I'm going to use this and I'm going to dissolve these edges. And when I do that, I'm going to get a mixture of these on the brush. And that mixture is going to allow me to put in this shade, which is a little bit darker. Right? So I'm, I'm using this. I'm kind of making, I'm contaminating my brush a little bit as I go by picking up the darker shade. And then when I put this in here, it's going to be a little bit darker. Grab a dry brush, again, dry brush, and just blend out that edge, make sure it is nice and soft.
And Kevin, we've got uh, some students talking about just the Evolve program and, and how you know we also are putting out free stuff. Um, and uh, so Carrie, one of our students, was saying the free stuff is great, but nothing compared to what you get as an actual student in Evolve. And I, we kind of talked about it even earlier today before this live stream, but um, do you want to just share from your perspective what is the difference between the kind of you know free stuff that we do um, on YouTube and things like that compared to what the actual program offers? Sure, I, I want to keep it brief because I, I yeah, again, this isn't we're not doing this as a way of selling Evolve. This is this is that's not the intent, and it's not the intent to answer Evolve specific questions here. But what I would say is just education, right? Not even Evolve and the difference between this and that. Education in general requires three things. The first one is a comprehensive and well-structured and organized dissemination of knowledge, right? Piece one, when piece one should be taught in a way that it can be understood. Once it is understood, then piece two is added. And they're building blocks and they eventually they create a solid foundation without any fissures in them. If all of the information is given in proper order in a way that is easily digested, right? So that's the first part of any education the dissemination of knowledge. And if a teacher teaches something and the student doesn't learn it, the teacher didn't do their job, right? The idea is that if you teach something to somebody, they learn it. Otherwise, you didn't teach it. You just told them about it, right? And so for me, like when I teach, I'm always looking for better ways to explain, right? So it's not, as long as a student puts in an earnest effort, and this is my belief, as long as a student puts in an earnest effort, the student can't fail, but the teacher can. A teacher fails by, by not being creative in their way, uh, creative in how they disseminate the information to figure out a way to make every student that's putting in the effort um, capable of understanding and applying a skill, right? And so if you are, if you're a teacher and you basically have one way of teaching something and you have 30 kids in a class and 18 of them get it and the other 12 don't, you, you didn't really teach. Right? Some kids just kind of grabbed it with what you had. Right? A good teacher would then say, okay, well, those 12 that didn't get it, I've got to now find another way of explaining it. So maybe you find another way and you, you give that to them and maybe six of them get it. Now you've got six left, you've got to find another way of breaking it down in order so that they understand. And until you have addressed every single student in that room that they all get it, you have not finished. Your job's not done yet. And so that's, and that's my philosophy as a teacher. So, but the dissemination of knowledge is the, is, is the first part of an education. The second part of the education is guided experience, which is absolutely critical. And guided experience is just simply having somebody who knows what they're doing watching over you while you work, right? So I can give you something to do and I can explain it perfectly. And then you understand it, but somewhere along the hours and hours of you working, you find a path of least resistance a cut corner and you do that a little bit and you seem to get a decent result and so you cut another corner and another corner and eventually you're not actually getting a good result but it's degraded slowly over time you don't even see the problems guided experience means that a guide will be watching you and saying oh no 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 whoa 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 you're getting off the path let's kind of push you back up onto the path and we can start walking again as you're going you start to meander off the path again in another direction they push you back on Right, so the guided experience is having someone who knows what they're doing to make sure that you stay on the path towards your goal. And the problem with YouTube videos is that there's nobody to watch you. You can take something and all of the lessons can be lost in translation because we all have our own ideas about what words mean and, and then we start working and it's like, well, this isn't working. I must be doing it wrong. Yeah, you're doing it right, but you just haven't got the finesse yet. So what do you do? You change it, you manipulate what you've, what you've been shown until it gives you a result that kind of resembles what you were seeing. But now you've got something degraded in your work. Instead of kind of pushing through that hard path to actually get it right, you've found a new way to do it. And you, what you wind up doing is developing bad habits, right? And the reason, we, you notice no, people never develop good habits accidentally. All accidental habits are bad habits. And the reason is what we're doing is our brain is finding paths of least resistance. That's always what we're doing. We're not trying to find harder ways to work, we're finding easier ways. It's efficiency. And so, what we, so without a guide, 
we will find the paths of least resistance and degrade the quality of not just our work but our education in the process. So that guide along the way is critical to the development of your skills. Doesn't matter what it is. It could be, it could be painting, it could be um, building houses, firing a gun, chopping wood, hitting a speed bag in a gym. It could be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Having somebody who is there that knows what they're doing to watch over you while you work. And then the last part is your personal commitment. How serious are you about developing the skill that you're trying to develop? If you're indifferent, the quality of your education is going to suffer because when things get a little bit tough, you're just not going to push. You're just going to let them go by. And if you are very serious about this, no challenge will deter you. Right? And so you've got those three things. Education and knowledge, guided experience, and then your personal commitment. When you start talking about a program like Evolve, like this, there's no guided experience if you take this and do it at home. I'm trying to give you every single little possible thing that you could run into and address them here so that when you go home you have as much information as possible. But in the end, as you start to get off the path of what I'm doing, because you will, and invariably that will happen, you'll have nobody to tell you that it's happening. And so the painting won't turn out exactly the same, right? Because if you do exactly what I'm showing you, your painting will be exactly the same as mine. If your painting is anything but exactly the same as mine or just as good as mine, it means that the guided experience that you needed wasn't there and so you meandered off the path and there was nobody to bring you back on, right? And that's not your failing because in order to be educated, you require that component. Um, you could put in all the effort that you want and have all the knowledge but if you don't have that guide to hold your hand while you earn your experience, right? Because experience can't be taught. Experience can only be earned. You notice I said ex giving you an education and knowledge. Th that's a very, very small piece of what, what I do here. Most of what I do is built around experience. 30 years of doing this has, has informed me in a lot of ways how to nuance those small pieces of knowledge. But in the end, all you can be taught is the knowledge. Experience will show you how to nuance it. And the more experience you have, the greater the nuance, the better control, the ability to fly through a painting instead of kind of moving slowly. But in the end, you need those three things. What we're doing here is an education and knowledge. You bring the commitment. One piece is missing. All YouTube videos, almost every program that you see where they teach you and then they let you just work on your own is missing that critical component. Very, very important. Almost impossible to, to, to fully grow without it. And Evolve, for those of you who don't know, Evolve actually has that. We have instructors that check everything that you do. So you're never, ever alone in the program while you're developing and earning your experience. No more questions per Evolve specific, okay? Thank you. Sounds good. <clears throat> so I'm slowly working my way through this. And again, this is, this is quite challenging today, um, I have to admit. It is quite challenging as I'm trying to figure out, trying to guess at where this thing is going to land when it dries. Finding a half measure on everything is, uh, and, and hoping that I'm, that I'm landing in the right place is a little, bit, uh, a little bit much. But we shall see next week when we come in, won't we? We'll see exactly where we wind up. And then again, if there's a problem, then you'll get to see me resolve it hopefully. And if there's no problem, then, then there's no problem. You just see the process as it was intended, um, being brought to completion. Just keep me aware of the time as we go, okay? Sure. It's 9.50 right now. Okay. So we're about an hour out. We're pretty good on time, I think. Mm -hmm.
and trying to manage the amount of paint that I'm putting down. And again, this, this value issue is, is wreaking all kinds of havoc on my senses as I'm doing this. Um, this is really is challenging. I'm, I'm very curious to see how this thing is going to dry. If we wind up everything lining up the way it should. Yeah, and whoever gets the painting in the raffle, they can say, oh, this is the painting Kevin, Kevin struggled on. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see where he made a mess. Right, I'm not going to go back in. So like these paintings, I'm not going to go back in and fix them or anything like that. They're going to be what they are, right? So, you know, if the painting winds up being a bit of a mess, well, whoever gets the painting gets a painting that's a bit of a mess. Um, these paintings are for, you know, they're for educational purposes. And so, like, I won't commit any time or energy to them after the demo is done. Um, however they finish up in the demo is how they'll be sent out. You know, Kevin, I've seen a lot of your paintings and I'm just waiting to see you finally tank one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all talk at this point, right? Yeah. Every once in a while, you'll struggle a little bit. I'm getting a little excited, but nope. <laughs> you pull it back together again. I appreciate the. Uh, I appreciate your support. <laughs> yeah. You sit in there cheering for for me falling on my face. Thank you. Well, um, after success, after success, you know, it gets more interesting when you start seeing the, the struggling yeah. moments. Yeah. I see the walls start to crumble. <laughs> He's human. Look. But like, you know, like I said, I mean, this is all what you're seeing here is experience. Like I'm, I, it's not that I'm, it's not that it's not really challenging, but I'm not rattled by it because I know that, I, I know that it can be pulled around. Um, it's just a matter of like staying calm and just kind of working with what I have. And, um, and again, I'll see where it lands when it dries and then I'll have to make I can't make all my plans for the thirds uh, for the last stage are now out the window. I have to formulate a plan when it dries and I see what it actually looks like. So, and I was talking about that earlier, like I, I have to be flexible. In this case, I'm now being forced to be flexible. Um, there's no choice in the matter for me. And this is one of those things you get to see the, the measure, what do they say, the measure of a man, you see how he behaves under adversity. So when we get off camera, we'll be screaming and cursing, crying, all kinds of other fun stuff. You can put your head on my shoulder. Thank you. That's appreciated. <laughs> So I think I'm think I'm okay in here. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go one step darker again just to get in here. Um, I didn't touch that before, but I want to make sure that I've got soft edges.
Can you do me a favor? Can you grab a tube of black paint for me? I'm going to... Actually, actually, no, I don't need it. I'm going to use gray. Um, I'm going to... I have to fix this mouth later on. Um, so I'll just put, I'll put a mark in later. Um, I don't want to leave it till next week. I want to do it now. So... Again, just going around and making sure all of these edges are soft. Again, I can always put in a hard edge later on if I need, but taking out a hard edge is very difficult. I'd rather err on the side of being too soft than too sharp. All right, I'm actually using the darker shade to dissolve this edge. I'm not blending it very smooth. Um, just enough that it feels like it turns the form, but nothing more. These things, they're not silk smooth. You know, they're, they're soft in here, but they're not like really, really, like, you know, you can see these hard breaks from shadow to light, shadow to light, right? There's some soft turns, but nothing, too, nothing, nothing so soft that you Hey everyone, just so you know, we, uh, we're having some te technical difficulties right now. We've lost sound on Kevin's audio, so just give me one moment to get us back up and running.
something the way it is at that stage. I don't assume, I don't ever assume that I've got everything right. In fact, quite the contrary, I always assume that my painting is riddled with mistakes. And so I'm constantly searching for them, right? We have the, the proverbial death of a thousand cuts, right? So no single cut causes the death of the victim. It's the, it's the cumulative effect of a thousand drops of blood being removed from their body, right? The, the opposite is true as well, right? If I have a painting and it's got a lot of little mistakes in it and I am constantly scouring it and as I'm working, I'm finding the mistakes and I'm eliminating them. I'm basically bandaging them up and fixing them. Each one of those adds to the health of the final painting. And so I am constantly looking for any little thing. Again, you know, the death of a thousand cuts is these thousand tiny little, almost like paper cuts. All they need to do is extract a drop of blood a thousand times. Well, if you could, if you could find those thousand cuts and heal them before they gave that drop of blood, you'd wind up with a perfectly healthy human being at the end. The painting is no different. I want to try to make sure the painting is as healthy as possible, meaning that it has no injuries, no, no cuts, as, as we're talking about. And that requires that I am conscientious and that I don't assume that everything that I put down is a good mark, that I'm looking for my mistakes because they're here. They're in here. I do have mistakes in here. There are imperfect marks. And the reason that there are imperfect marks is because as I'm working, no matter how well the painting is going, I don't have relationships in place when I first start. The relationships happen as the painting progresses. And the painting is not the right color and value in each place. It's how each color and value relate to the ones next to them. And so until the relationships are in place, I really don't know where things are. I, I, can, I can estimate based on experience and, and what I understand, but in the end, until the relationships are in place, I really can't see the painting for what it really is. And so I can be putting stuff down where it doesn't belong and not know it until all the relationships are established, but I can fix it once they are established. And so what I'm doing is as I'm working, I'm looking for places where I can make those corrections. So for now, I'm just working with this one value. I'm gonna get everything filled in that is not, that's not filled, and then I'll start establishing, I'll clean up those relationships make any adjustments to the values as they need to be adjusted, clean up my edges, and basically be done. I missed a value in here, so I'm going to have to figure out where that is. I'm going to put it in here. Yeah, so I'm missing a value between my darkest and this one. Like I said, I'll just lay it in once I finish with this. I, I try not to bounce around too much. I don't want to switching out the values on my brush as I go. If I can help it, I want to just let whatever's on my brush be on my brush. I'll see that through and then I'll move back to the other value and put it in. Just a little few marks up in the hair. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not trying to paint every hair, I'm just trying to show the general movement here. Just a little impression. There'll be quite a bit of blended edges as I, as I move this forward. I'm going to have a lot of blending to do. I'm going to try to blend by putting in the values in between, try to soften everything along the way um, through intermediate values. Um, let's see, this, I believe we can get a... Just going back one value, and these values, they're not, they're not very different, they're very similar. Um, they're very subtle. And then here I can just fill in this gap. All right, and you'll see, like, once I get this in, I'm going to start just kind of pushing paint around. Um, start making sure everything is where it belongs. I'll probably sit back a little bit, giving myself a better view of the painting. The closer I am to the painting, the harder it is to see it for what it is. And so sitting back a little bit gives me a better view. So I've got a pretty good block in now. I'm feeling pretty good about what I'm seeing here. Um, Okay, so I'm going to be working between these two shades for now. I'm going to work with the darker one, and I'm just going to start pushing it into place. It's going to mix with the lighter one, because the lighter one is, I'm painting, I'm painting over the lighter one. It's going to allow me to break these edges down. And it's going to allow me to establish some of these, some of the structural elements that are underneath the skin. And again, I'm able to keep it nice and controlled, very, very subtle. So again, I have to go in with a darker shade over here. So this I can put in here. And again, all I'm doing is following what the photograph is telling me. I mean, I'm thinking about it, but I'm, I'm following what I'm seeing here. It's allowing me to, this paint is allowing me to really kind of soften these edges as I go, dissolve them. I really won't have to do much to them after this. They'll basically be done. I'm going to go to my darker shade. Just got a few edges in here that I need to manage. And again, it's going to mix with what's down. And so in doing that, it's going to, it's going to get a little bit lighter. It's not going to be just this shade coming off the brush. 
And again, what you're seeing now, what I'm doing, is mostly experience. I know why I'm doing it, but the confidence with which I tackle this is experience. It's not knowledge. Um, I know I can just kind of roll through this now. I can be pretty aggressive, and I'm not worried about doing any harm. Right, and so there's, there's power in confidence. So my confidence allows me to tackle this thing fearlessly. Right. Like I said, I'm not trying to replicate the photograph. Just, just trying to approximate it. Again, I'm now going to move to my lighter shade, and I'm going to try to dissolve the edges of this, of this highlight. Again, just go around it. It's less prominent in here, so I'm going to overwrite it a little bit. Don't have a lot of paint on my brush. Um, I don't want to completely wipe the highlight out. I just want to dissolve the edges. Again, all the wet paint, pushing into wet paint, I can reshape this stuff if I don't like the shape of it. Constantly going back and getting more paint so that I'm not just pushing around whatever I pick up here. I want to make sure that the paint that's coming off the brush is the paint I intend. Again, make sure all of my edges are dissolved to the degree that I want them. Again, I can leave this painterly it doesn't have to be like, you know, like hyper real. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of hyper real work, of coming from myself anyway. Um, I like my work to be a little bit looser. Um, but at this point, I can probably leave that forehead just the way it is. I don't really need to do much else with it. Um, I'm going to handle this edge over here. You know, I'm just moving through my palette here, whichever shade I need. So this is my darkest shade. I'm just going to soften this edge. And again, the hair is not razor sharp. It's not like, it's, it's pretty subtle because it's, it's mostly, it's so thin, it's almost see-through. So I don't want to establish anything on this edge that's so strong, so abrupt, that it, um, that it like, that the hair looks like as solid as, as you know, as like the, the lip. I want it to be a little bit softer. I want it to be a little bit more subtle. Same out here. Again, the hair just kind of tapped on the shapes. I'm, again, I'm not worried about, about painting every little hair. I'm just kind of approximating some of what's going on here. And again, what you're seeing is experience. I mean, I can't, I can't stress that enough. It's, this is, I can do this because I've earned, I've earned this level of comfort just manipulating paint. All right, I've been doing this for so long. I'm not afraid of making a mistake. And this is one of the, the things I was saying earlier, like, you know, when you're learning, be fearless. Like, stay within the rules you've been given, but be fearless. Don't worry about putting the painting at risk. Just paint, right? That's, you're gonna learn the most if you do that. If, you, if you're so tentative that you're afraid to put the painting at risk, you're gonna learn very little. Right, you have to be bold. Again, you have to stay within the rules as you're learning, but you've gotta be bold. down the nose. I'm just going to go back in with my darkest shade. I want to push in here a little bit and establish some slightly darker values. And again, it's mixing with what's already down, so, which is the intent.
back up to my light, start managing this. And actually, I'm going to spread this highlight out more. I'm going to push this highlight out. It's much broader out here, very soft. It takes up more space. And I'll push back into it with the other shade if need be. Again, I'm just pulling it out and dissolving its edge. I'm going to get a lighter highlight at the very tip of the nose. So right now, though this looks very bright, it's going to get, by comparison to this other highlight, it's going to be knocked down. It's not going to be quite as bright. So now, going one step darker, start using this to, uh, actually I'm going to go two steps darker, start pushing back into it a little bit, just dissolve it. Make sure everything, and again, I'm just pushing it around. It's my responsibility to make the painting what I want it to be. So if something's not what I want, I do something about it. All right, if I pick up a value and it's too light, I don't just paint with it. I put, the br I put the value down and I pick up a different value, the one that gives me what I'm looking for. <clears throat> right, in the end, this painting is, in every mark that goes down is a mark that I make. And so I'm responsible for all of them. I don't get to hand responsibility for anything that's a failure within the painting, anything that I don't do right. It's on me. So. Since that's the case, and I can't displace the responsibility, I take the responsibility seriously as I work. I remember when um, my, my oldest daughter, the first time I took her out driving, she, um, she drove my car. We were just in a parking lot. And we went around a turn. And she turned the wheel a little too far, and she didn't turn it back as she went around this tight turn. Mm -hmm. And instead of hitting the brakes, or turning the wheel away, she just ran into the curb. And she kind of like panicked, ah, 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 and then boom, hit the curb. So she was waiting to be saved. She, she, didn't, she didn't take command and just turn the wheel or just hit the brakes. She was waiting like it wasn't, like she didn't realize that she was in control, that she could have stopped the car or turned away from the curb at any moment. All she had to do was keep her head about her and do it. And so when you're painting like this, you own every mark. The, no paint goes from the, can, from the palette to the canvas without you. And since you own every mark, you're responsible for them. If you take that responsibility seriously, and I don't mean to be like, you are responsible for every mark and I like, better be right, but if you take responsibility for the marks, if you think of them as being under your command, you, you gain a control over this. Like psychologically, you gain a control over it. This painting does nothing without you making decisions. It is completely at your command. So be thoughtful about the commands you give it. Be measured in them. Take your time as you figure this stuff out. Again, but like for me, like I said, I, don't put down any paint that doesn't look right. If it doesn't look right, stop. Like, don't just keep throwing, you know, throwing good after bad. Stop. Dial it back. Slow down. Figure out what's wrong. Again, like in this case, it's too dark. Well, I just move up one value. It's too light. I move down one value on the scale, right? That's pretty simple stuff. When you're working in color, it's really not that much different. And you can really see how, at this stage of the portrait, um, especially like on that one side of the face there, you could take this painting and, like it doesn't have to be as refined or realistic as you're making it right now. You could leave it loose and impressionistic um, and it would still be incredibly structural. It would make complete sense and everything. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it, like, yeah, this stuff in here, if I just knock the edges down, I could probably sign it and, you know, I mean, obviously, if somebody was commissioning this, they would have an issue, but it would still be a solid face, right, and which is the goal. The goal is a solid, recognizable face, and we've already got 
a good um, representation of the subject. Painting basically looks like her. There's still room for the painting to be developed, right? And I'm kind of moving through this with a little bit less care than I did the um, the color painting. But again, this isn't this is an educational tool it's to me. As I'm working on it, I'm thinking of it purely from the standpoint of disseminating information. And so I'm not concerned about it being like this spectacular, um, this spectacular painting. I'm looking at it as a, a means to deliver information. Right? And so I'm not worried about the end result nearly as much as, as I would be if I were working on, say, a commissioned piece. Right, I, I worry, obviously, not worry, but I am very concerned with the, with the deliverables on a commissioned piece. Where with this, I'm not, I'm not really concerned with that. I am simply working. Um, I'm, I'm working and I'm trying to share information that will be of value to people um, after I'm no longer here working on this. People come in and watch. So. But you're right, I could leave this, a lot of this, really unfinished, and it would be just fine. Right? The overall impression is in place. Right? And that's, that's really the starting point. Can you get the impression? And again, like you see, like I loaded up the brush, I brought it up here, and then I thought better. I decided to go in the other direction, use the light, the highlight value, instead of the, instead of the, the, the slightly darker value. Um, again, like even in, uh, you know, I picked up the paint, I was committed, and when I got up here, I thought better of it. I'm the one putting the marks down. I'm responsible for what goes down on the canvas. I stopped. I decided it wasn't the way to go, and just made a change. And it took me all of two seconds to switch out the paint. I know that doesn't sound like anything, but let me tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've watched students, they pick up paint, and since they pick that paint, they put it down, and they know it's wrong, and they keep painting with it instead of stopping. Right? And I see students do it all the time. And so it sounds like a silly thing, but people do it all the time. I, I, don't, I don't really know why. I mean, it's, it's just because it's an effort to go back and get the other paint. And you've already made you already made the decision, and so you just you just run with it. Um, the idea is when you're doing this to break those kind of habits, to, to recognize that when it happens, and to be able to to put on the brakes and stop that. So that everything that goes into your painting is what you intend that it's doing the job that you intend because it's the right value, it's the right color, it's the right brush mark, right? It's, it's the right everything because at any point in the process, all the way to the point where you touch the canvas with the brush, if something's not right, you have the power to stop. You have the power to fix it. And since they're your marks, like stop them if you know that they're not right. Like, and that, that requires, like, not treating this like a road exercise. Like, I put these marks down. I'm watching what every mark does as it hits the canvas, or as the board. Like, I'm not assuming, like, I can fill in this whole area once I make the right decision. I'm, every single time I touch the board, I'm looking to see what's happening. So I can, I can course correct the painting in real time if need be. And a lot of the time, that's actually necessary. Um, I would say more often than not. You can't go on autopilot once you make a decision. 
You have to you have to stay on top of the on top of what you're putting down and see it through all the way to completion before you turn off your brain for a moment. Otherwise your painting your painting is kind of just freewheeling doing its own thing. Now you're not taking responsibility for the marks. And once you relinquish responsibility, it's no longer your painting. There's no intent connected to it anymore. It's now just doing what it wants. I think you see me just rounding this stuff out as I go. Just touching these edges. A little bit of paint on the brush, but just touching the edges. And I'll come back in with the light and I'll push back out. Question for you, Kevin? Yes. I know we're recommended to always start with fresh paint. Is this also your preferred way of painting, or do you just have people do this for the purpose of getting used to mixing the palette? Um, well, so pa oil paint dries in two stages. Once the first stage begins, you don't want that to happen and then go back and start working with it. So I recommend always putting out fresh paint. First of all, your materials, if they are fighting you, it makes the process so much harder. It's why we use Old Holland paint, because we know the materials are extraordinary. So we know that the paint isn't going to be a problem. If you have a problem with the paint, it's you, it's not the paint, right? And so it's something you did, it's not the material. And so like if you let paint half dry and then start working with it and you start running into problems, those problems are created by what you've done, right? And so for me, always put out fresh paint, always. That to me, it, it, it's not as wasteful as you would think. Um, you don't have, put, have to put out a lot of paint, but always put out fresh paint. It's just, it's good policy, I think. And so, yeah, I actually do. I put out fresh paint. I, I always do. Yeah, so often enough, I, I tell you to do something, but I don't do it myself. But with the paint, yeah, I always put out fresh paint. If you go and you watch the um, Grand Master portrait, every day it was new paint. Every day. Over the course of like, what, 12 weeks, 13 weeks, every day the paint was fresh. Like Dark. I said, I mean, there's enough of me to do as I say, not as I do. But in this case, something else? Yeah. Dark Star, who asked the question, said, I feel so guilty throwing it away. Yeah, well, you know what? That's life. You know, so, you know, you value the paint, but not your time. So your time is your most valued commodity, right? Of everything you have access to, money and whatever. Your time is your most valued commodity because it's limited. There is, there is a finite amount of it. And you don't know how much. One hour, one week, a hundred years. You just don't know, right? And so you will burn time fumbling around with, with paint that is not fresh. You, things will take longer. You'll have to learn how to manage it. It's not always going to do what you want. It'll dry faster on your panel because it's already in the process of drying when you start working with it on day two. And so it causes problems here that eat up your most valued commodity, your time. So the idea is value your time. The paint is replaceable, right? And the truth is, we send you more than enough paint. Like we send so much paint. I'm assuming it's an evolver. Um, we send you so much paint. Like these grayscale tubes have a hundred portions in each tube. A hundred portions if you use it the way I told you. And you only have like 30 paintings that you use them on. Even if you did two full days on each one, you would still have 40, 40 portions of paint left in the tube when you were done. You have so much more paint than you actually need. So you can be a little bit wasteful. Don't be, don't just throw away paint, but like you can put out what you need, or you can always put more. Don't put out, you know, a one inch bead of something that you're only going to use a, a dot, uh, like a little dot of. So be thoughtful when you put the paint out, you can always put out more.
But don't worry about throwing away a small amount of paint at the end of the day. If you're throwing away massive amounts of paint, that means you're putting too much paint out. But you shouldn't be sweating what you throw away at the end of the day. And again, value your time. You know, that's, most people, they're so, so worried about the financial aspects of these things, they forget that their time is actually more valuable than the product. brush yeah like for me I just put down some marks with a brush that was a little bit too big for the space so got to come back in here and kind of clean up what I just did not really a big deal just momentary inconvenience And just softening everything. Where are we on time? It is 10.33. Okay. There's a chance I won't be painting this. I, I may block it in. I, I don't know. But there's a chance I won't be painting this. Um, again, this is, this, is a, this is for learning. It's not, it's not about being a finished painting so much. No. Yeah. Okay. I'm not a, I'm, again, I'm not a, I'd rather not be rushing on this. So I don't want to feel rushed, I'd rather. And I do, I do want to finish on time. I don't want to run over. So again, just putting staggering my values, going from lighter to darker until these edges dissolve and they give me what I want. And again, I'm constantly back and forth. I'm looking at what's going on here as I'm going. Remembering that like, as I'm putting paint on top of paint, they mix and become combinations, right? So if I were doing this in color, this, these combinations would be creating mud, but in grayscale, I can get away with it. All right, and again, like this is stuff that we teach. Like in grayscale, there's a lot of room to, to, to kind of mess around with the technique and not do it properly and not be penalized for it in the final work. Where for some of these things, if you did them in color, you, you would create real problems for yourself. All right, but again, we've already done this painting in color, so you've seen it. Um, so again, that's why like, I'm not so concerned about it. You just get a general idea. At this point, I'm just trying to make the painting, I'm trying to pull it together. Right, and I think the stuff that's going down is darkening as it's, as it's drying. Some of these contrasts look stronger than they were when I first put them down. Could be wrong about that, but I'm kind of getting that sense. Again, all I'm doing right now is managing edges, sharp edges and graded edges. Right? Everything started out kind of sharp, but I'm now just managing them, making them what I want them to be at the end, sharp on one side, graded on another, whatever it is that I'm looking for with each edge. Some of them I want to dissolve. So I'm going to have to go in with a darker shade. I've got a couple of these things that I've kind of been careless with. 
So when I'm done, I'm going to go and I'm just going to clean up the mouth and clean up this eye a little bit. I've just been a little careless, kind of moving the brush a little too quick here. And again, not a big deal. Nothing is ruined. Not something I have to really worry about. Just gonna rub this and soften this edge just a little bit. It's really harsh. In the photograph, it's really quite delicate. Got a nice comment here from Rob. He said, can you tell Kevin thanks for that tip last time about drawing with lighter pencils for the beginning sketch so that it's easier to erase and correct? It's a simple but powerful thing that's helped me draw. Great, glad that it helped, glad that it helped. You know, so many simple little helpful things that they're effortless to share. You just have to have a question posed so that you know to share it. Um, you know, which is why we have this forum so that as I'm working, you can pose questions. Allows me to maybe bend the curve for everybody a little bit. You know, I know I, I, know I said this somewhere along the way, either during this video or the last one, but. Like I do this, I do this because what I'm trying to do is share with everybody that wants access to it what I wish I had when I was learning, right? That's what this is, what I would have given to be able to watch somebody do this, Fig, you know, maybe help me to figure it out rather than for me to do the struggling, right? And so for me, I actually have done the struggling and now what I'm trying to do is share it with you so you don't have to struggle to get the result. Right, and that's, to me, that's a pretty cool thing to be able, to be able to be that for somebody, I think is pretty cool. Um, again, it's something I wish I had when I was younger. I, you know, this stuff, I figured this out, I like, you know, I had to reinvent the wheel at every single turn as I was doing this. And so if I can, if I can basically show you how the wheel is made, you don't have to do that struggle. Yeah, the paint's actually darkening, I can tell. Because um, I know I put this down here, and now it's like... So, hmm, I have got to figure out why that is, because I'm... That's... It's unexpected. It's unexpected, I'm not really sure what's going on. It's gotta be... It's gotta be the substrate, um, for whatever reason. I know the medium that I put in it would not have done that. So it has to be the board, how I prep the board. That's interesting. But strange, I've never had anything like that happen before.
Once again, I'm just going to knock down some of these edges. Just a dry brush. And I'm, for the most part, I think I'm going to just call it a day on this. What time is it? It is 10.42. Okay, so I'll play around a little bit more. I have a couple of extra highlights to put in. But I, by and large, the, the painting is actually looking pretty good at the moment. I'm happy with it. I do want to make sure that I'm taking out any edges I don't want in the final painting. And again, there's still another stage. This isn't done yet. Still another stage which is going to bring, uh, bring even more contrast and, and volume into the painting. Just going around looking for places. Moving the paint around that's already down. If I can't move enough of it to change the shape or the shade of the thing I want, I'll just grab more paint. And then marry that edge. Right, so I'm not just pushing paint around. I'm only pushing it around if it's giving me what I want. If I need to, I'll add more paint into the mix as I go. I'm just trying to make sure everything is in place. And just adding some values in here that I that I feel belong based on how everything looks at the moment. Question. Yes. From Gwendolyn. Have you worked with any other medium? I know oil painting oil paints are your preferred one, but are there any others that you like? I've worked with everything over the years. Um, I've sculpted. I've painted with acrylic, airbrush, oil, um, watercolor. I, you know, it's, it, you can't formulate an opinion about what is best if you only do one thing, right? And so for me, I'm all, I've always been looking for what suits me best. And so I constantly step outside of my comfort zone, um, looking to see what's out there. Right? Sometimes you find things you like. Sometimes you have no interest in the thing that you find, but it helps make you better at the thing that you do enjoy. Right? You never really know unless you step out and, and give something else a shot. So yeah, um, right? And I like that that um, Harry Styles video shows that, like how how much I'm willing to step outside of my comfort zone, starting a painting in a live stream using completely new materials stuff that I never use, right? I mean, um, 
again, I'm not risk averse. I don't mind, I don't mind jumping into new things. And so um, for me, I like, the, I like learning new things. Um, and you know, you just, you gotta get out there and experience things in order to grow. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm constantly, I mean, these days I don't get to do very much. But when I was younger, yeah, I mean, I, I did everything. And it was a lot of fun. Again, I, like back then, like none of that was a waste of my time because I was trying to grow. I was trying to get better at, at what I was doing. And the more I knew, the more informed I was, the better I would be. And so always looking for more information. Yeah, but I found oil paint is, is more versatile, I think, than any of the other mediums. Um, it does a really good job of replicating the other mediums. The other mediums can't do that with oil. Each one of them has its own distinct thing that it's got going for it, and that's it. Oil paint can almost mimic the others. Um, not exactly, but you can get pretty close. I can make a painting, I can make a painting with oil that looks airbrushed. And in fact, I've had paintings when I was younger, when I was an illustrator, where people thought that it actually airbrushed them, that they weren't actually oil paintings. Um, because they were so clean and so smooth, there were no brush strokes in them. And, um, and again, some of the looks, like for those paintings, I was using, I was using what I learned from airbrushing to make those paintings. Right? I wouldn't have been able to do them if I, if I hadn't learned how to use an airbrush. And so um, I, was, I, I was no expert with an airbrush, but I, I did have enough of a sense of how it worked that I could capitalize on what made it a strong tool. very lightly dusting over this end of the eyebrow, just lighten it up a little bit. Marry it into the painting on that side. And same over here, just a little bit lighter. And the same back in here, just got a little bit of light on the eyebrow. Very, very little paint on the brush. I think, okay, I want to just drop in this one darker shade. Just clean up those couple of marks that I messed up. It is 10.50. Okay, we'll be done in about two minutes. Like I said, I'm not going to worry about the rest of this. Um, I may knock out the ear. Let me just see how quickly this goes. Any other questions while we're kind of finishing up here? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to yep. now drop would be them the time. Question here? Yes. Do you have any online art galleries just like many other artists? Um, no, actually I don't. I don't, um, so my portrait clients, I only take them through referral. So I don't have any reason to have an online presence. All right, and like most artists, like they depend on access Right, people being able to have access to their work to see it. For me, because of how I bring in portrait clients, like I don't do a lot of portraits anymore. Um, I'm 
very busy with the educational end of things. But my portrait clients only come to me through referral. I do not take strangers. People don't just show up and call me. It's, um, I, I, I'm not interested in headaches anymore and back and forths. And I, I like the idea of sitting down with somebody who already knows, they've already been told what to expect with me. They've seen a painting, they like it, and they want something like that. It just makes my life easier. And so I don't have an online place where I'm posting my work. Um, also, a lot of my clients over the years are very private people. Um, and so, you know, with my contract, I have a thing that says I can show the work wherever I want, and they strike that. They take it out. They don't want their family being seen. Um, they don't want them posted on my website. You know, and it's like you get famous actors and things like that. They don't want their kids, the portraits of their kids, they're paying you for it. They don't want it posted on your website. They don't want you treading on their name. And a lot of people, a lot of people who are wealthy and who have influence are like that. And so a lot of my clients, they don't have no interest in me, in me posting their work even if I wanted to. So, um, but like I said, my clients at these days all come through referral, so I don't need that. I have a, a beautiful, like, I think it's like a 12 by 14 inch hardbound binder um, of my work that is sent out to clients when, when they're interested in commissioning a piece of art, just so they do see what I have. They see a broader body than whatever it is that brought them to me. Um, but I don't do the digital thing. Okay. Another question? Yes. I feel like my skin looks like heavy concealer. Your skins look smooth and perfect. Any tips on how to make it not look like caked on makeup? Uh, yeah, I use conditioner. Are you, this? Oh, you mean the painting. Kevin. Um, <laughs> it's how the paint is applied, right? I'm really softening the edges, but I'm, I'm again, it's, there's a, there are a lot of underpinnings to what I'm doing. There's an education in here. Again, what you're seeing here in a, to a very large degree is performative, right? Because you, you can't hear what's going on in my head. You can't hear the thought process. The only way to really be able to do this is to have all of the understanding, all of the training that has led up to it. And so that's where an education comes in. I couldn't explain to you how to make skin look like skin without teaching you all of the things that I teach in Evolve. Um, because those things would explain to you how to do it without ever teaching you how to do it. If you wonder, because all I'm doing is putting shades of gray down right now and managing the edges that connect them. And yet, even in grayscale, this feels like skin. It feels soft and pliable. It feels like skin, even though it's not even in color. But all I've manipulated are shades of gray and the edges that connect them and nothing more. If you think like that, you might be able to figure it out, right? I, I, I don't, there's no way to really get beyond that in a conversation that is not built entirely around actually teaching what it is that we do. Um, again, you're seeing my confidence in doing it as experience, but the application is, is just knowledge. I know how, I know how to manage all my edges, um, and I know how to manage my values. And so if you, if you understand how values and edges work, then it's just a matter of taking your time and making sense of them. Like I was saying earlier, understanding, understanding the values and the edges and what they're doing in the painting before you put each mark down. If you can do that, you can paint skin right now. Like you don't need more of an education. You, what you need is to be able to sit and take your time to perceive and understand what you're looking at so that you can then move the paint around to approximate it on a, on a panel, right? And, I, and that's, I know that that's like, that doesn't really help, but that's the truth. Um, you know, it's like I had a, many, many years ago, I, I had gone to, I'd gone to the School of Visual Arts for one semester. And I asked my, uh, there were a lot of reasons, and th this is one of the reasons. I asked my painting teacher what colors to mix for a basic Caucasian flesh tone. And the teacher said to me, well, you'll learn that in your third year. And my thinking was, I don't know, I'm paying for the education. I pay your salary. Could you just answer the question for me? And if I can't use the information, well, that's on me. But if I can use it, then I walk away from here 
able to do something I wasn't able to do a few minutes ago, right? At least some, it gives me a, a starting point. Now, the truth is that he actually couldn't answer the question. He was an abstract painter. He actually didn't know what colors to use to make a flesh tone. But rather than admit his ignorance, which, and I understand, I understand that. You know, he didn't want to admit that he didn't know the answer. He just kind of brushed me off. Um, but the truth of the matter is that there's no such thing as a combination of colors for a flesh tone. Because every flesh tone in every scenario is different. So there's no baseline, right? If I put you under neutral daylight and you would have I could give you the colors for that, but if you take that same person and put them in the shade instead of in the light, the colors are completely different. It's not even like you would use the same red. It's completely different colors. And if you take that person and you leave them in the, in the light, two hours later, the colors are different. And if you put them indoors, the colors are different, right? And so there was no answer to that question because the answer is you need to understand how color works in order to be able to do that. There is no such thing as a flesh tone. There's what this flesh tone in this certain scenario looks like. And so again, going back to this whole thing about the skin, until you understand how to break something down by shadow and light and edge, none of what I could tell you about how I made this feel like skin in grayscale would make any sense. It would have no value. I'd be wasting your time trying to describe it. It's the underpinnings that make this possible. It's the, right, so what I'm doing here is I'm creating visual poetry. Hidden behind the visual poetry you're seeing is an alphabet, a vocabulary with spelling. It's grammar. It's eventually sentence structuring and building out paragraphs and organizing my thoughts and then taking that and adding a flair to it which turns it into poetry. All of that is happening behind the scenes. It's happening in here while you're watching the brush strokes go down. There's no way for me to explain to you how I made a poem in a language you don't write or read or speak, right? And so that's basically, that's basically, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the answer that you want, but it is the reality of this. Unless you speak this language, this will, if you'll, it'll be elusive. I know we're really coming up on, is it 11 already? Yeah, it's 1059. Okay. And I'll also just add to that conversation that, you know, when you do have that language, then when you're watching, like you can re-watch these live streams. Um, even I was just learning something just from watching Kevin from here um, and how he handled his highlights because really, you know, like his, his flesh tone, his uh, whatever, this, this, the skin tone, the texture was very um, soft and not cakey, but it was just very soft and subdued. And then it wasn't until he really put in those highlights that you got another dimension of what the texture was like. And so you can go back and you can watch how Kevin is doing these things. And that's not a, it's not a foolproof answer. It's not a formula kind of an answer that you can apply everywhere, but um, it can be helpful in, in sort of understanding how he's, you know, there's the values, edges, and color on a broad scale, but you can also kind of localize them in the way that Kevin did when he was putting in his highlights. Kevin got very specific about each highlight and how he was, um, what's the word, like even like stippling those highlights know. in. Is that the word? Yeah, okay. I would say we so. We can go with that. <laughs> so yeah, so, but anyways, having that language does help you learn um, even more as you go back and watch this stuff. All right, I know somebody's gonna be getting the painting, so I don't wanna just leave it a mess. I'm not finishing this stuff up, but at least it's blocked in, scribbled in. Now we still have another pass to go, correct? Yeah, but I'm not gonna be able to work this stuff in that next pass. Gotcha. And I'm not going to come in on another day to kind of do this. Again, I've already painted this painting. Um, so Nothing more beautiful than unfinished works. Go into museums, you see them everywhere, unfinished. So I'm going to stand by that as I leave this unfinished.
I'm going to actually I'm going to stop right there. Yep, so that's it. And that looks pretty good, pretty solid, considering all of my jabbering today. Yeah, and a uh, friendly reminder to everyone to um, enter into the raffle. Uh, officially, we will close the raffle uh, tomorrow. So that's Friday, March 4. And so now is the time to enter in so that you could potentially receive this painting for free from Kevin. Okay, let's call it a night. I know I'm still doodling here, but I'm, I promise I'm stopping any second. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. All right, then. Um, oh, yeah, Greg, I'm going to drop in the, the link in here real quick for you. Kevin, we're going to stay alive just a little bit longer so I can drop the link in. What was that? I'm going to stay alive oh, just a little okay. bit longer. That's fine. All right, so I just dropped in that link so people can use that. I'm also going to post that link in the comments after this live is ended. All right, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming, and have a great night. Thank you.